This guy had a dream life. And this is not a fairy tale. It all seemed like yesterday, but it really was yesterday. He was fighting a monster with a smile on his face. He mockingly compared this snake to an eel in a frying pan. When he started talking about how slow this snake was, he immediately received a sharp blow from behind. He was quite inattentive, which often became a problem for this boy. The snake hissed furiously at the boy, who he says just wanted to have fun. He notices that his armor is damaged just below the shoulder. The guy was already tensely telling himself that everything was fine, it was to be expected, but he got angry. Shouting about how lousy this snake was, he jumped higher than this long monster to attack. And yes, another feature of the guy is that he gets angry very quickly. He hit the snake so hard that sparks flew. The boy enjoyed feeling the power of the snake when it became angry. He did not stop. His sword made the snake's teeth fly off. The boy liked to swing his weapon and use magic. During the fight, the boy heard the sound of heels. It confused him. He did not quite understand what it was. But he had a secret, and the secret was that he was sleeping. A woman with long white hair appeared before his eyes. With his tired eyes in mind, he did not understand who she was or where she came from. At first, he thought she was a fan who was following him, but he was too tired to react. He lay on the bed and thought about how he was exhausted after the fight. The woman came closer, touched the sheet with her feminine fingers, leaned over and kissed him on the forehead. He noticed the smell of flowers on her breath. She decided to make him happy with a light morning kiss and called him Sunshine. The guy was surprised to hear such words from such a beautiful lady. Did she really stand next to him all the time and look at him? The guy could not hold back any longer. He touched her neck with his hand and pulled her closer. Their lips were just a few centimeters apart. In this woman's arms was a cooing baby reaching for her chin with its hands. He looked at his little hands and did not understand what was happening. This boy had become a baby was in the arms of a beautiful woman and could only make baby sounds. She realized that Arel was probably hungry. And the boy realized that he had been reborn again and began to cry out. And with tears on his sweet cheeks, he began to realize that he had died in that fight in his past life. The woman cradled the baby, saying tender words to Arel, how cute he was. Unlike other humans, he is reborn every time he dies, and so on ad infinitum. The little creature ate from a baby bottle he had to eat, not just fill his head. This was his first rebirth. Past lives flashed through his mind. He was different. And if his memory serves him correctly, his first life was in Korea. That life was a terrible hell for him, which was a constant job interview and job search. A sad life that ended when he was hit by a car on the road. Then his life was quickly cut short and he was reborn for the first time. He slowly opened his eyes and found himself in the body of a baby in a completely unfamiliar foreign family. The mother, judging by her clothes, was a nun, and the father was a man with a mustache and kind blue eyes. Since then, he has been reborn again and again, and the most interesting thing is that he could be reborn in a completely different world or century. Thus, he was once in space, looking at a starship in armor, or he was a samurai and a girl. The scenario of his life repeated itself every time. He has nothing to brag about. He got used to this scenario and just went with the flow. He was reborn differently each time. It became something familiar to him. And now, lying in his mother's arms and drinking milk, the baby wondered where he had been thrown this time. There was a sheet chandelier hanging on the ceiling and judging by the interior, he thought it was some kind of Middle Ages. Old-fashioned furniture, gilded design, and a fireplace. He found himself back on planet Earth. It seemed illogical to him. He was reborn into another world. All his thoughts continued in his mother's arms, and with a bottle in his mouth. Another world? The baby stopped the treats? He liked other worlds better, because they were usually much more comfortable remembering his previous life working in a nanolab. He was lucky. He was not born into a poor family. 
On the gorgeous mantelpiece was a bottle of probably not cheap alcohol. Behind his mother, he saw the maid, who also impressed him. He was very happy to think that he was born into a wealthy family. The mother pressed her lips to the baby's soft cheek. The mother's love was very strong. She asked the child if he was full. This world has its own language. So often when he found himself in a new world, he could not understand many things. But the warm and gentle hands of his mother holding him, the loving gaze of this woman, spoke for themselves. This mother loves him infinitely. The boy had many different mothers, and remembering his former parents, who did not have such loving eyes, he could finally conclude that many people give birth out of a sense of duty. Immediately after his birth, he was often left on the street corner, or he was forced to work in a mine to earn the life he was given. He has a good feeling about this life. His mother was still standing in the bright room, holding him in her arms. The mother was called in a formal manner, calling her Mrs. Lafana. She went back to the maid, who offered to leave the little prince with her if the mother fainted. The information that he was a prince surprised the boy. But the mother's emotions changed dramatically. She asked the maid if everyone recognized him as a prince. The lady was interested in her opinion. The maid was frightened and said that they would. But the lady did not believe her and assured her to tell the truth if she thought badly of him. The maid anxiously replied that of course she did not. The lady apologized and explained that the other maid had recently taken too much liberty. The boy, still lying in her arms and sucking his finger, began to understand why his mother's face had changed so much. His mother said that even though he was a prince and had imperial blood in him, his life would not be easy. It would be easier if he was not a prince. The mother apologized to her son for this. The maid assured the lady that everything was fine. But the lady knew that everyone was talking about her and the child. The mother started talking about how she was the reason Arel had no chance to inherit the throne. She continued to apologize to her son. The child raised his hand up, touched his mother's face, and wiped away her tears. The mother had a smile on her face. It seemed to her that he understood everything. The maid, named Chun, was amused and did not take Madame's words seriously. Arel wanted his mother to calm down, because he was fine. He didn't care that he would not inherit the throne because being a prince was already a blessing in disguise for him. The maid was still standing next to the lady with the child in her arms. The boy decided that he would simply not respond to all sorts of annoying plebeians, and even the imperial family would not be able to control him. Arel was near the steps where the emperor stood at the table. He was crawling there, and was already looking forward to his future rich one hundred and first life. He was in his crib, crying out sweetly, as the sun's rays came through the window, and thinking that this must be a dream life. He was the son of an emperor and a former maid, a half-breed prince like that, a life that could be lived quite well if you didn't get involved in politics. He could already imagine himself sitting around girls, having fun and chatting over a glass of wine. Since he had the blood of the emperor in his veins, he was guaranteed more or less comfortable conditions. Little Arel imagined himself riding a big horse with a bow and arrows behind him. His dreams were interrupted by his mother and maid, who stood over him and admired the happy and carefree child. The mother wished she had the power to protect her son from the world. When Arel heard the word, strength, he looked at his mother and thought that, indeed, strength would not hurt anyone. He continued to suck his finger with a thoughtful face. Everyone on a high throne should be able to stand up for themselves. He would have to learn to do so. Blood and fear flashed through his mind. But all this was familiar to him. He had already felt the cold of the sword blade and the taste of blood on his skin. The lack of the right to the throne is weakness. No one needs you. If you are weak, no one will stand up for you. Rather, they will look for a way to get rid of you. And you will lie lifeless in blood. But mom does not have to worry. The screaming baby lived a huge number of warrior lives. He was a magician, a samurai, and a fighter. Three months later, there was a huge palace on a slope. The sun shone through the window of little Rel's room, where his mother came in. 
the little child was sleeping with his fists clenched. The mother compared the sleeping child to an angel. The mother looked at her son with a light smile and a kind face. She touched his beautiful blonde hair. The maid called Mrs. Lafana and told her that the carriage was ready. The lady waved her head and said she would be right there. Finally, she leaned against the child and kissed his temple. She whispered in his ear not to be sad because his mother would be back soon. The lady followed the maid, leaving the sleeping child in that spacious room. There was a loud bang on the wall. The loud sound woke Arel up and interrupted his interesting dream. He covered his mouth with his little hands in fright. Looking through the crib bars at the door, he hoped that the Nani was not running to him yet, that they would not leave him alone for a second. Everyone was so nice to him, and the hyper-protection was exhausting. While he was alone, he wanted to check something. Looking at the light from the window, at the dandelions in the vase, he hoped that the imperial blood had at least some family power, and that if so, he should learn to use it. A strong wind blew, shaking the plant in the vase. Little Arel tensed and concentrated. A bright ball appeared between his small hands, shining with magical light. The world is ruled by the strongest. When you are strong, no one has the right to tell you what to do. At least, he could use the experience of his past lives. His crib was no longer in a bright room, but in the cloudy sky. Even in the body of a child, he could accumulate inner strength. The magical light rose higher and higher, which meant that he had the power. He remembered a secret technique from his thirtieth life, when he was called Hongwen Changsa. The magic light continued to shine. He also wanted to try to train Sun Qianji and Han Wanji at the same time. Even in the body of a child, he had to do it. No one would have thought that a child of that age could train. The light was no longer visible from the window. Arel was radiating this light. If he continues training, by the time he is ten years old his inner strength will have increased many times over, and by the time he is twenty years old he will be invincible. The chandelier on the ceiling shook from the magical power. To begin with, he had to concentrate on the energy as much as possible, so that he could train even in the arms of his nani. The energy was passing through his small body, and he could feel the power. Arel had to speed up. He was very concentrated. He was combining the flow from his whole body, bringing it all together. His small hand was swallowed up by a large flow of energy. Arel's face was tense, dripping with sweat, and permeated with magical energy. His head began to split. Now he had to release the energy. In his crib, he was already bursting with energy, and light was already filling the room. A sudden knocking of boots. His nani screams in fright. She is incredibly surprised by what she sees. But Arel was already resting in his crib. The nani asked if his diapers were wet. But the boy wanted only peace and to be left alone. After all, all the magic he had accumulated would simply disappear with just one touch. He mentally begged for it. The nanny leaned a little towards the baby, who was pretending to sleep very hard. But she did not touch him. She thought he was probably just having a bad dream. Arel was left alone in his crib. As soon as he realized that there was no one else in the room, his strength grew again. It was already the maximum energy he could get. He just needed to hold it a little longer, but he started to feel feverish. Arel was sweating profusely, but he kept holding the energy. He hoped that the baby's body could withstand such a strain. But for him, it was better to die than to live in the body of a weak person. So he clenched his sweaty hands into a strong fist and continued. The boy had to accumulate a lot of energy as soon as possible. He tried his best. And at one point, his blanket flew up, almost touching the ceiling. All this was for his well-being. Arel himself was almost reaching the ceiling. He began to scream loudly, so loudly that his nani ran out into the hallway and hurried to the door in terror. The nani ran as fast as she could to little Arel. When she got closer, she was surprised. How could he have been sweating so much, and most importantly, why? Arel was lying on the cot with his mouth open. The girl thought that he seemed to be sleeping. She wanted to make a bath with herbs to wash him. Meanwhile, 
Arel lay sweating in the crib while the nanny hurried to the exit. The baby's hand reached out to the rays of the sun coming through the window. It was a victory. He had made it. The wet but thoroughly satisfied baby stood on the bed and celebrated his little victory. The nanny was at the crib. She was cradling the prince in her arms. He looked very happy. The nanny cared about his condition, so she was also happy that the baby was feeling well. Arel was actually happy that his nanny didn't suspect anything. He used the technique of mana concentration as if in a trance. Arel could easily accumulate it in his body. Now, even when he was in his nanny's arms, or when he was sleeping or eating, he could accumulate it. And he didn't have to do anything else to do it. The prince lay there and rejoiced at this thought. He was holding his cheeks, which were almost bursting with smiles. The kid realized that in three years, he could accumulate as much energy as he needed to match an adult, and when he was ten, there would be no one in the whole world who could beat him, even if he lives a hundred lives. The nani noticed some strange haze from above, but a sincere smile and tiny hands distracted her from it, and she again paid attention only to the baby. All he could think about was that he would only get stronger, and then he would heal like a king. Arel could not wait for that moment. He imagined how cool and powerful he would be. The Tower of the Kingdom Five months have passed since his birthday. The prince was crawling on the mat. And thanks to the mana absorption technique, his physical abilities will improve greatly, and his internal energy is already accumulating faster than that of his peers. After all, mana is collected automatically. Arel did not mind that he was crawling on the floor, because when the time came, his strength would be incredible. Suddenly he stops. A happy mother picks him up from the floor, and a nanny stands next to her. The mother noticed that her child was growing up very active. The lady brought something for her baby. She pulls out a children's toy. Arella was puzzled by this toy, not understanding the reasons, but he was still very interested in it. The baby could not take his eyes off it. Something else surprised the kid. He looked at his mother and realized that she was disappointed with something. But she continued to show him the interesting toy, and the three of them were sincerely happy. The mother knew that he would like it. But Arel felt the cringe from himself. But he did not stop playing with the toy. The nanny noticed that the prince looked very happy, and the mother promised that she would play with the baby often. The mother wondered who her son had taken such a good look after, and the boy immediately had an answer of course, his mother. Arel didn't bother to show off. Since he was loved, he could enjoy these moments, because they are not endless, and therefore priceless. Arel's eyebrows were furrowed, and he looked somewhat dissatisfied. His mother thought he was already bored. In fact, the baby was very hungry. And he began to cry. He blamed himself for such childish behavior, but he could not do anything about it. The nanny realized that he was hungry. The baby was very happy about it. The mother sat down on an old wooden chair. While the nanny was feeding Arel with a baby bottle, she decided to ask the lady about the money. After all, the baby needs to be well fed, and since yesterday, less and less money had been allocated. Both the nanny and the mother had worried faces. The mother knew about it, but unfortunately, she could not do anything about it. The nanny agreed that this was not an easy situation. The budget for the maintenance of the mansion was cut very much this year. It was difficult to raise even one child. This conversation began to interest Aurel. He had heard this kind of conversation before from the maids, who said that they had to save even on Mrs. Lafana's diet, because otherwise not everyone would survive the season, and there was no other choice. Aurel did not think they were serious. The lady assured the nanny that she would not die of hunger, and that they would survive everything else. The nanny suggested saving money on security. But the baby could not believe his ears. He continued to drink from the bottle and realized that his mother was just an ordinary concubine. She had neither status nor power, even though she had given birth to a prince. The situation was getting even worse because it was cold outside. The nanny tried to give some advice because she realized that it would be hard. She didn't want to be discouraging but it would be impossible to farm in winter. 
Arel was more and more surprised at how bad things really were. He had expected that if he was already a prince, he would not be allowed to die as a baby. The Nani continued to feed the baby, and then asked the lady if she could ask the highness for money. The mother sighed heavily, and said that it was hard to see him. He was too busy lately. Now the little boy understood where his mother was going in the horse-drawn carriage. It seems that she did not succeed in meeting the ruler. No matter how tough a leader you are, it is unacceptable to behave like this with the mother of your child. She came to see him, but was expelled, and the door was slammed in her face. Why did he treat this unfortunate lady like this? She had enough ridicule from the nobility. Aurel stopped eating and began to think about a plan of action. Even if the king had been initially uninterested in the lady, but this attitude. Poor mother. The little boy was touched by this situation and began to cry. The nurse handed the baby to the mother. The mother gladly took him. He wanted to help her. And despite the fact that he was just a child, he believed that he could do something to help. Nothing special came to mind, but he clenched his fists and was determined to think of something. It was a dark night, and the moonlight was shining on the kingdom's tower. There was no peace in the children's room. Arel sat there, arms folded, thinking about his plan of action for this winter. He realized that the only problem was lack of money. His little head realized that in winter, heating the house was also added, which took a considerable amount of money out of his pocket. Arel thought hard about how he could help. The baby was making baby cries in the room. And suddenly he had an epiphany. The thought almost made him break the bars of the crib. What if he tried something? He got to his feet and looked at the fireplace. Come to think of it, coal has a carbohydrate structure, just like diamonds. The thought made his face shine with happiness. He noticed that there were precious stones around his mother's neck. It turns out that in this world it is also considered a treasure, and that it is possible to make some money from it. The solution seemed simple to him. If there was no money, at least the gems could be found. Aurel was already dancing and trying to get out of bed, but his short legs did not allow him to do so, and he fell on his butt. He angrily stood on all fours, knowing that the mana he possessed could help him. A bright light appeared in the room. Using his energy, he was able to fly out of his crib. The boy flew to his goal across the room, with a magical light around him. He got to the coals. No one would notice that they were gone anyway, and most importantly, there were plenty of them in the fireplace. Arel stood there with a satisfied face, and with light movements of his small hand, he turned the pile of coals into real diamonds. Arel was serious, so he got down to business. This was no time to be idle. He had to turn the coal into gems while everyone was sleeping. The kid began to conjure by the fireplace, from which a pillar of fire grew. He was concentrating on his work. Arel had to turn mana into heat energy. He bent his hands over the wood. As he raised them higher, a magical sphere formed, shining brightly in all directions. He created the pressure and temperature locally that were needed to turn coal into diamonds. The little prince used his mana to its fullest capacity. He would still be able to accumulate more. If he survived, of course. His face was becoming even more tense. Sweat was streaming down his pretty cheeks and the magic sphere was becoming more and more powerful. Under no circumstances could the energy leakage be allowed. Arel was grunting under the sphere, trying to squeeze it again and again and again. He had to release even more internal energy. His legs could barely support his body, but he was determined to hold on to the last. Just a little more. More light began to pour from the sphere into the room. Arel wanted to make his mom happy, so he kept trying. Arel imagined his mother smiling, as he wanted her to, and smiling even more. To mom! Arel shouted and huddled closer to the ground. The energy pouring out of his body was very powerful. The light filled almost the entire room. A huge column of smoke and ash rose up and out through the chimney. His hands reached for the fireplace. Arel was still small so reaching through the fireplace great was a challenge, but he did it. The kid's joyful face was covered in soot, and he held a diamond in his hands. 
such a beautiful and pure stone, it was definitely a diamond. Happy Aurel sat by the fireplace with a jewel he had created and thought about how he should slip it to his mother. He fell to the floor screaming with happiness. Aurel did well, he did it. Morning came in the kingdom. The nanny came to the nursery and wished the little prince good morning. She was scared when she saw him on the floor. Aurel was crawling on the floor and making baby sounds. He was friendly and happy, and the nanny did not understand how he jumped out of his bed. She kept asking herself the same question, because his bed was high enough for such a small child to climb out of. The nanny reached out and picked him up and asked him if he had been on the floor all night. Aurel was sucking on his thumb, and the nanny noticed that the baby was dirty. The nanny looked around the room, looking for a place where he could have smeared himself. Her eyes naturally fell on the fireplace. She also noticed that his blanket was on the floor. This kid must have been having fun all night. The nanny also noticed that the floor was dirty. Maybe it hadn't been clean for a long time. It's good that at least the kid didn't get cold during the night. The kid would not have been so worried about himself. He's actually fine. Aurel put his hands over his mouth and started chewing on something. The nanny did not understand what he had put in his mouth. She asked him to spit it out, reached for his hands to cover his face, but the baby continued to pretend to eat something. The nanny took hold of the baby's cheeks. Aurel spat out a bright diamond. The nanny was incredibly surprised by this. She could not believe her eyes. How could he have found it? It couldn't have been on the floor. Aurel looked happy. He was laughing like a child. The nanny played with the baby, still not understanding where the stone came from, because she had cleaned the room very carefully. Such a diamond can fetch a good amount of money. Thanks to it, they will be able to get out of this unpleasant situation. The nanny hugged the little prince with relief. He was such a good boy. As Aurel rested on the maid's shoulder, he hoped that his mother would also be happy with this news. After a short period of time, horses with carts carrying supplies rode into the kingdom. They brought enough firewood to get them through the winter. Vendors hurriedly carried large bags of food. The empty kitchen storage was quickly filled with food. The guys were carrying boxes and bringing them into this room. In general, that diamond was definitely sold at the most favorable price. It was enough to cover five years of living expenses. In the children's room was Mrs. Lafana, the Nani and Arel, who was playing on the floor with toys. The mother was reproaching herself. She had doubts about the correctness of her actions and thought that the diamond belonged to someone else. The Nani did not think so. She told her that the castle had been empty for almost a hundred years before Mrs. Lafana moved in. The mother accepted this. The nurse thought that it was a gift from God, coming from heaven for the little prince, who was crawling happily on the floor. The mother calmly agreed. She was happy about the situation. Arel's little hands took hold of his mother's skirt. He wanted his mother to wait until he was older, and he would save her from all kinds of worries. He imagined himself kneeling on his knee in front of his mother, but he was still small and could not even reach her knee. Mrs. Lafana would hear about Arella. He will personally tell her the whole truth. All winter long, the butler kept the fireplace warm. The blazing fire filled the children's room with warmth. The financial situation changed for the better. The dinner plates already contained juicy meat and vegetables, and everything looked delicious. The mother asked the nanny why she needed so much food, because she couldn't eat so much on her own, and the nanny told her not to worry about anything and to eat until she was full. The maid with the purple hair wiped tears of joy from her face. She was happy to meet the other maids again and she was very grateful for it. The nanny next to her and another maid said that the little prince was the one to thank. The maids who had been fired earlier due to lack of money were now back at work. And most importantly, the mother now had a smile on her face. Arel looked at his joyful mother knitting. The funny little boy was mesmerized by his mother. How beautiful she was when she smiled. The winter was very cold. There was a blizzard outside. Visibility was poor, and snow covered the tree branches. But they kept her warm and comfortable. A year later, 
green leaves adorned the tree, the sun shone on the great kingdom. The nani was holding a brand new white baby jumpsuit with a red tie, which she offered to put on Arella. The nani offered another suit with a red blouse. Mrs. Lafana could not choose. She liked both suits. The lady found a costume with a shirt and a blue cardigan that she really liked. Little Arel sat meekly in a peach-colored shirt, then a chef's costume. The nani and the lady could not make up their minds. They kept changing the baby, who was already tired of this fashion show. He didn't understand whether there was a holiday coming up or what it was all about. He was tired and wanted some peace, so he used a more effective technique to stop these endless changes of clothes. Arel took a deep breath, fell to the floor, and began to be loudly naughty, crying and beating his hands and feet on the floor. This trick worked on the nani and mom, and they got the hint. Arel was screaming so loudly that the chandelier started to ring. Mrs. Lafana took her baby and put him on the bed. He was already quietly tasting his finger and was glad that the dressing up was over. Today, finally, the prince would be officially introduced to the imperial family. This information from the nani surprised Arel. His mother confirmed this information. She was glad that they had managed to survive this year. He is forced to be recognized. Although Arel is still a child, he still has the blood of an emperor in him. Today's birthday is the best occasion for this. The Nani was sure that the king would show up. He couldn't ignore Mrs. Lafana and Arel forever. She thought it was just because parents often try to stay away from babies. The lady was not very happy to hear that. Arel overheard this conversation and realized that it was his birthday. He wanted to make the biggest bouquet of flowers possible. His mother said that her son would officially be on a par with the royal family, even though the laws of the empire were on the side of the little prince. Arel noticed that despite the fact that the mother was smiling, she was clearly feeling anxious. The boy peered at her through the bars of his bed. He was frightened to think that if it was a banquet, then most likely there would be all sorts of aristocrats dressed in various fashionable costumes. But he would have been happy to see his father, who had treated his mother so badly. Classical music is playing. There is wine, fruit, and various delicious snacks on the table. Musicians are playing in the center of the room. A guy plays the violin and a girl plays the piano. The number of distinguished guests in chic attire was growing. Arel, dressed in a nice shirt with a red vest, asked how much money had been spent on all this. He was sitting on a large blue card chair, and was laughing like a child. His nani and mother stood next to him. Arel was surprised that people dressed so elegantly for such a banquet. Mrs. Lafana asked him if he was enjoying the event. He opened his eyes and looked around with interest. It seemed to the nanny that Arel was a little confused by the new people, because he had never seen so many of them before. The mother hugged the baby to her and reassured him that Arel was the most important one here. Suddenly, the prince felt the eyes on him. He saw slanting glances, quiet whispers among themselves. It confused him a little, but he decided to ignore it. He was more interested in the empty seat on the red Belair throne. Where had this emperor gone? The Aurelius Arnesius was his father. Aurel was furious with him. He wanted to look into his shameless eyes of someone who had never visited the child he had made. But he tried to calm himself down. He should not be interested in how this man lives. He folded his arms and thought that he just needed to know what he looked like, for fear of bad heredity. Shortly after the banquet began, these people did show up. Gorgeous skirts stretched across the floor. It was the imperial family who were being greeted with honors. Arel saw the empress and her children. She looked very chic. Her red dress with its puffed sleeves and bows on the belt looked expensive and her hairstyle with a crown burned her eyes with its shine. The children looked like her. It seems that they were his sisters and brothers. The imperial family continued to walk past the people who bowed to show their respect. Aurel noticed the older, gloomy and serious boy, the only one who stood out from the family. And then there were the younger brothers and sisters. Aurel did not understand why they were so serious. And he got angry when the family went through the lineup, 
and paid no attention to Mrs. Lafina. His mother, hearing his childish discontent, hugged him and told him that it would soon be over. For Arel, his mother was simply the best. No matter what, Mrs. Lafana was smiling, and the guests at the banquet praised the Empress's beauty. Arel noticed his mother's look. He did not understand what it meant. Her eyes were surprised and her mouth was open. She looked ahead of her. Arel looked to see where his mother was looking. He felt the tension. It was the Emperor. But he was not a commoner. He seemed to glow and burn with fire. Arel was incredibly surprised, because he did not understand what kind of energy the Emperor held within him. The Emperor appeared on the doorstep. But he was not just majestic because of his status. He seemed to glow and burn with fire. Just by his appearance, he made the talkative nobles, and their servants immediately fall silent. Everyone bowed their heads before him. The emperor continued walking with a tense face. Arel instinctively felt the power that the emperor exuded. The sound of his brown boots filled the room. He stood in front of the nurse, Mrs. Lafana, and Arel. The prince did not understand who he was looking at either at him or at his mother. The emperor's gaze was stony. It's a pity that rebirth doesn't also give you the ability to read other people's minds. It would be so much easier for Arel if he knew what everyone else was thinking. The emperor walked along the red carpet, getting closer and closer to his place of honor. After a while, Arel began to receive gifts. Guests came up to him and congratulated the prince on the holiday. Some said it was an honor to see the prince. The guests bowed before him. It was time for congratulations from the imperial family. Aurel sat on the lap of Lady Lafana. They said that the prince was very small, even tiny. And they said it with a kind of mockery. This family did not hesitate to openly express their attitude towards Aurel and his mother. The prince was childishly angry in his mother's arms. That imperial woman made him very angry. How dare that woman speak of him in such a way? She probably didn't even consider them human beings. What scoundrels they all are. Arel looked at this crowd of people with anger and thought about stunning them with the baby's ultrasound. His mother pulled him close to her to calm him down. She asked him if he wanted milk. This act calmed him down, and he decided not to be naughty so as not to upset his mother. Unfortunately, in this place hypocrisy is a common thing. Everyone continued to congratulate him. Arel wanted to leave. He was almost falling asleep in his mother's arms. But suddenly someone started touching his cheeks. This immediately woke Arel up. His cheek was reddened, and there was a little girl with a red bow in her hair standing next to him. Her strange eyes were looking at Arel. She called him a fat boy. Judging by his eyes, he was most likely the daughter of one of the emperor's maids. This child did not really understand his status because of his age. Two imperial maids came up and greeted Arella. The mother thanked them for coming to the celebration and asked them to enjoy the banquet. They turned around in silence, which confused the mother and Arella. And when the banquet was over, Arel held his mother's hand and they exhaled a sigh of relief. Mrs. Elia approached Lafana. She mentioned that she hadn't seen Lafana for a long time and asked if they had a safe trip. Mrs. Elias said that they had no problems thanks to her son, the heir to the parsonage. He was always by her side. Mrs. Elijah looked over to her son, who stood calmly with his eyes closed. It seemed to Arel that she was showing off her son. But what else could he expect from an empress? Elia noticed the resemblance between Arel and Mrs. Lafana, who had already gotten up from her chair with her son. Mrs. Elias' face was happy, and she was admiring little Arel. But Arel wanted her out of his sight. He suspected her of being the reason they were poor. Even if no one cared about the prince, the castle's finances would not have been lowered to the bottom so quickly. They used knights in armor to cut down a couple of trees for heating. And as it turned out, Arella's clothes were sewn by maids from rags and pieces of cloth. Elia wished the prince a long life, and Lafana thanked her for it. Mrs. Elia turned back with a strange smile. And then, there was that thud of boots again. It was the emperor, who puzzled Mrs. Lafana a bit. 
The emperor asked the woman how she was feeling, if she was used to the castle. The mother humbly thanked him for his concern, and Aurel was shocked. What was the point of caring if they were almost dead from cold and hunger? Aurel was loudly crying. He wanted the rascal to give them money and at least cover their living expenses. Mrs. Lafana tried to calm Aurel down. The emperor put his finger and chin to his cheek and thought. He asked the lady to take him in her arms. The emperor held a quiet Aurel. It was surprising to him that he was no longer crying. His other children used to cry incessantly when they saw his face. The little prince decided to show his whole self. Aurel smiled so much that his eyes closed. Let the ground spread under his feet from this beautiful smile. Mrs. Lafana was a little worried and watched this action. The emperor called the kid funny. But Aurel was serious. He was not afraid of this man. The prince began to break away from the emperor's hands. He let go of the baby and put him on the ground. The mother said that he could not walk yet. But the emperor was not surprised, because he was only one year old. Aurel sat on the floor and lifted his body with his hands. All the guests stared at Aurel and looked at him in amazement. The emperor also stood there in shock. Aurel was able to stand up and walk on his own on his own two feet. He was overjoyed at his achievement and wanted everyone to see his success. He became the star of the evening. The Nani happily shouted out that the prince had taken his first step. Mrs. Lafana burst into tears of joy. The emperor put his hand on his chin and marveled at this little prince. He is full of surprises. Aurel had a little more to go. He wanted to show the emperor that he was not like all the other children. Aurel walked confidently to the table, right in front of all the imperial nobility. Here he is Prince Aurel. He reached the table without any additional help and took the tablecloth in his hands. He began to jump from foot to foot, pulled the tablecloth with all his might, and pulled it off the table. Everything on the table fell to the floor. Glasses, bottles of alcohol, trays of food. Aurel was incredibly scared. Everything fell to the floor, broke, and there was an incredible noise. The mother put her hands over her mouth in fear and the Nani was also frightened. The emperor was also frightened. Nothing terrible or unusual had happened. Aurel wanted it to happen that way. The little feet walked boldly on the tiles. Everyone was fascinated by the prince's first steps. No one noticed that it was a carefully thought out plan. He walked to the tablecloth with confident steps. He chose the right moment and reached for the tablecloth. Then he jumped back. Just like that. That was exactly what he wanted. He fell down with everything on the table. Aurel began to cry loudly. The emperor's hand reached out to him. And, of course, for the sake of believability, he had to cry even louder for even more attention. He was a child after all. The emperor picked him up from the wine-stained floor. He looked to see if he was hurt. The mother and nurse ran closer to them. The best child actor was fine. He had just been drenched in wine. The emperor told Mrs. Lafani that her child was fine, just needed to be changed. The nurse came closer and asked for the child. The emperor waved his hand and asked her to wait. The emperor tensed, his face looked terrified. He clutched the child's stained clothes tightly in his hand. He took them off and saw a cheap and dirty bone suit. The emperor saw the old suit under the clothes. This made him angry. The Nani made excuses, but did not really know what to say. She personally dressed him in a brand new white suit in the morning. The emperor looked at the Nani and the mother in silence with orange angry eyes. The guests were in an unpleasant shock at the clothes Aurel was wearing. Everyone began to discuss his rags. They suspected that he had money problems. The emperor raised his angry eyes at the guests. He shouted and made everyone shut up. Everyone bowed their heads down in shame. He looked at Arella carefully. The emperor was interested in what made them dress like that. Arell was pleased because his plan had worked. This morning he had been changed by his nani, and after she left the room, he concentrated his energy in his crib and began to stretch the fabric with it. He easily managed to make it look stretched. Of course, if he had the muscles of a grown man, 
he wouldn't have needed to use mana. But the most important thing was that he had brought out this uncomfortable truth. Arel wanted everyone to know this truth. The nanny was biting her fists in anxiety, and Mrs. Lafana ran up to the baby, who was in the emperor's arms. The emperor asked her to tell him the truth. He did not understand whether it was really so difficult to live up to one status. Mrs. Lafana was shaking with fear. She could not even string two words together. But the emperor shook his head and realized that it was not her he should ask. He looked away and called for Jin. He was there and ready to help. The emperor asked how much money was allocated for the maintenance of the concubine's locks and why such an important event was happening. All the guests were still there. Jin said that the budget was divided equally, as the emperor himself had ordered. According to him, everything was done as ordered. The emperor did not understand what he meant. He ordered him to bring a report immediately. Arel was surprised at his father's seriousness. The young prince was also interested in the report. The emperor still held the prince in his arms, and he looked at Mrs. Lifon with a serious face. She was making excuses, and the nanny was behind her, upset. The emperor silently handed the boy over to his mother. She wrapped him in a tight hug. They were both very sad. Arel mentally asked them to be patient a little longer, because this was a chance for all of them. Broken dishes still lay on the floor. The musicians were distracted from playing their instruments, and the guests looked at each other and waited. Jen's black boots were approaching. He humbly handed the report into the hands of the emperor. The empress had an angry face. The imperial children looked at their father observantly. He looked over the papers. When he read the entire report, he realized the cause of the problem. He immediately clutched the papers in his hands in anger. His anger turned into a bright fire in his hands. Mrs. Lafana was frightened, and Arel looked out from under her arms to see what was happening. The emperor burned the report to ashes. It became clear to Arel that the emperor did not know what was really happening with the distribution of funds. The emperor asked the empress and his eldest son if they understood what he was talking about. The emperor spoke as if to a wall. In response, he heard doubts, and the empress pretended not to understand what he was talking about. With an angry look, he explained that there was a big hole in the budget, and the concubines received nothing. The empress acted very surprised. But the emperor questioned her words. Managing the budget was a direct responsibility of the empress. And suddenly the emperor's son steps in front of his mother and shouts to his father. The son, actively gesturing, confidently said that there was some kind of misunderstanding, and his mother would never. The emperor stops his son. He did not care about this. It frightened the son. But the emperor clearly told him that a leader is responsible for the mistakes of his subordinates. And because of her negligence, his younger brother was left hungry and naked. The eldest son looked at Arel. The little prince looked at his eldest son with a serious face and a pretense. It seemed to him that this eldest son had neither the imperial charisma nor the cunning of an empress. Did the eldest son really think that the empress was not to blame at all? The emperor was really interested in this. The son bowed his head. The emperor crossed his arms. He was very disappointed with his wife's behavior and said so in the midst of everyone around him. The guests were shocked to hear this. And suddenly Mrs. Lafanu broke into the conversation. She asked not to blame her wife. She tried to take the blame, explaining that it was her mistake. The emperor looked at her. He wondered what mistake she was talking about. Ms. Lifon's eyes looked troubled. The emperor came closer to her. She had carried and given birth to the emperor's child. And, in the emperor's opinion, this was enough to be considered a member of the imperial family. Mrs. Lafana looked down at Arella. She wanted to continue to justify herself, but the emperor grabbed her arm. He explained to her that she must finally realize her status in society. The emperor was even closer to Ms. Lafani. A small smile appeared on his face. They looked into each other's eyes, and Arel continued to suck his finger. Looking at this, the empress was overcome with anger. The emperor turned to her and ordered her to find the culprits and bring them to justice. 
The emperor was not going to tolerate such mistakes any longer. The empress bent down a little, and guiltily agreed with his words, and promised to make sure that this would not happen again. Her hands were trembling violently. The emperor said that next time she would be punished. The emperor did not understand why he was so angry with her. But she still promised to find the culprit and punish him. Mrs. Elijah approached Mrs. Lefon. She expressed her sympathy for her, and did not understand how to justify herself to her. But Arel was sure that it was all an act. Mrs. Lefana was scared, and asked him not to apologize to her. Arel did not understand what was happening. Didn't his mother realize that the Empress was a real criminal? She knew everything for sure. Looking at the Empress Arella, everything about her was clear as snake. Mrs. Elia swore in front of Mrs. Lefanu and repeated that this would not happen again. Arel did not like the Empress's face. It was completely emotionless and innocent. There were two other maids whom she intimidated with her power. And so Arel's birthday came to an end. The hole in the budget was patched up, and a culprit was quickly found. It was a family of petty aristocrats, and they were made to feel guilty. They were dragged in, kneeled before the guillotine. They didn't really look into the case, and just executed them. It was a clear day in the kingdom. Three maids were talking in a room. They were discussing the case. At the end of the investigation, these petty aristocrats even took the blame. They wondered what they would do with such a huge amount of money. But the maids were happy that the problem was solved. Arel overheard the maids' conversation. He had his own opinion about it. He sat in his crib and was sure that the real criminal had escaped punishment. The trick had worked. Arel thought about this situation with his fingers on his chin. As soon as the execution was over, the case was closed. With his fist raised in the air, he knew it was not fair. But that was okay. He was sure that when he grew up, he would smash them all to smithereens. He was serious about revenge. But the feeling of hunger still prevailed over his desire for revenge. He fell on his pillow, screaming and crying to attract attention. The Nani hurried over with a tray of food. She picked up a spoon and scooped up the soup. The little prince sat behind the chair and opened his mouth so that the Nani would finally give him that soup. Arel understood that his body still needed work and work. He would be a baby for a long time. But now, he just needs to work on digesting food in his stomach and playing with toys. Happiness and nothing else. And now, after a hearty meal, it's time to sleep. A loud horse's voice was heard. It made Arel get out of bed and see what was going on. He did not realize how many hours he had spent sleeping. Arel saw that the Nani was sleeping on a chair, and there were knights and a horse-drawn carriage outside the window. Arel thought it was his mother's carriage. He leaned closer to the window and saw that she was accompanied by knights. He used mana to get closer to the window, but how else? He heard someone approaching the door. He assumed that there were about four or three people coming. One of them was his mother, who looked upset. There were also children's feet. They were coming to the door of his room. Arel completely forgot about the nanny, who could see his strength. He ran like an arrow toward the sleeping nanny. The speed of his flight made his eyes close. The door had already begun to open. The mother, a woman, and a child entered the room. The mother was surprised. Small hands were pulling at his cheek. Arel pinched the nurse, and she woke up. She asked the prince to stop. Mrs. Lafana asked the baby not to hurt the nanny. And Nani, in turn, jumped up from her chair with Arel in her arms, who continued to pinch her cheek. The mother instructed him that he should obey and love the nanny. Arel was happy to see his mother. He reached out to her with his hands. The second woman who came into the room was Mrs. Fenelia. The nanny had a frightened face when she saw her. She apologized to Mrs. Fenelia for not greeting her. The nanny bowed before her. A little girl was hiding behind Mrs. Fenelia. She said that everything was fine. There was no reason to apologize, because she had not warned anyone about her visit. Arel remembered his birthday. He remembered this lady from there. This is another concubine. Lafana said that if she had known in advance, she would have met Fenelia. 
It was not a problem for her. She wanted to come without anyone knowing. Miss Finelia's hand stroked her little daughter's head and asked her to sit down because she wanted to talk to Ms. Lafana alone. They went to another room. The two of them sat opposite each other with cups of tea. Ms. Lafana did not understand why she had come, but she was expecting a serious conversation. Finelia interrupted her thoughts. Lafana coughed. The lady asked if she was okay. Lafana replied that she was fine. With a small cough, she asked what she wanted to ask. Finelia, with a worried face and eyes full of guilt, apologized. This puzzled Lafana. The lady clarified that she was apologizing for her behavior at the banquet during Arella's birthday party. She did not stop apologizing. The lady had a very upset face. There was an awkward silence in the room. Finelia Kinsist. In the recent past, during the height of the wars on the continent, her family made the greatest contribution to the victory. Back then, knights fought with swords and on horseback. There was no one in the empire who had not heard of the Kinsis family. The sword used by a member of this family is still hanging on the wall. But now it is all in the past. Recently no boys have been born in this family, and their fame faded very quickly. There were rumors that they were in a difficult financial situation. Family members sat around and did not understand what to do, looking at income reports. Could it really be because of the family? Lafana went out of the picture, and Finelia said they were all in big debt. At the celebration, Mrs. Emilia called Finelia over for a word after what had happened. She put a bag of money on the table for Lafana. She was puzzled and immediately refused it. It was not what she needed. Mrs. Finelia wanted to give her the money. She realized that this handful of gold coins was not enough to solve the problem, but still. Ms. Lafania sat in silence, interrupting the information. Finelia continued to apologize, but she realized that she was beyond forgiveness. She said that Lafana might hate her, but asked her not to think badly of her family. Finelia turned her head toward the door. Her little daughter was there, looking at books in the library. Lafania looked at the little girl and realized what was going on. Finelia wanted to protect her child from conflicts with other members of the imperial family. She could feel the tension on their part. Lafania said that she was fine. She did not need money because she believed that Finelia was not guilty of anything. These words made the lady shake with misunderstanding. Finelia asked her not to feel sorry for her, and in response, she heard that it was not about pity. And then the lady started shaking again. Lafania calmly said that she had no reason to be at odds with her. She took the bag of money and held it out to Finelia, adding that she understood everything and held no grudges. With a smile on her face, she said that it would be better to spend the money on a gift for her little daughter. The woman even started to cry at Lafania's words. Everything became clear to the woman. Lafania picked up a mug of tea and explained that she understood the reason for the reduction in funding for their palace. She was not 100% sure, but she thought that this was the case. Then suddenly Finelia remembered something. Lafania had once been the empress's maid. Aurel overheard the conversation again and was shocked to hear the news about his mother's former job. The boy now understood why the empress disliked her so much. The baby started to feel sad for his mother and began to be capricious in his crib. The nurse came to him and asked if he was all right. He immediately calmed down and started smiling so much that the nanny would leave him alone. She was surprised at his very changeable mood and left him. The nanny sat down with Princess Kania, Finelia's daughter, who was reading a book. The nurse asked how much she had read. Aurel breathed a sigh of relief. He sat there with a serious face. In and out in and out. He folded his hands next to each other to re-energize himself and listen to his mother's conversation with Finelia. He made his way closer and closer to their conversation. Finelia said that she took this treatment for granted, that she had nowhere to go from the Empress's wrath. The lady put the cup on her plate. Lafania made a decision. Her expression became more serious. Until Aurel grows up, she will protect him with all her might and will not allow him to harm her family anymore. She will resist the Empress as long as necessary.
the lady offered her friendship to Finalia. This surprised her. It was not just a plot, it was a reunion of concubines. They looked at each other. Finalia agreed to this reunion. A smile appeared on their faces. If someone is in trouble, they will have a helping hand to wait for. That's what this is for. Arel realized that his mother knew everything. This upset him a little. She knew about the conflict between the Empress and the concubines. Arel wondered what his mother would do next. Would he have to prepare for all this in advance? His thoughts were suddenly interrupted. A child's hands appeared on the bars of his bed. It was the princess who had come to him. Arel wondered where she had come from. The little princess was very interested in the prince and smiled happily. The prince also started to smile, but he did not want her to bother him. Of course she did. The princess climbed into the crib and pulled the baby's soft cheeks. She was squeezing his cheeks, and he was annoyed because he was not a toy. The nanny noticed the crib. She hurried to take the princess out of there. The princess continued to torment the baby, who begged for salvation. But the nanny began to admire this tandem. The nanny and the princess admired Arel, who was already in the girl's arms. The nanny invited the princess to visit Arel, and she gladly agreed. Arel was upset at this. He cried and asked for help so that the whole palace was filled with his childish cries. Time passed, and now the prince was thirty months old. The baby was already standing confidently in front of the window. His third birthday was coming up. Arel stood in a philosophical pose and thought about the transience of life. But he really wanted to become an adult. After all, you'd be lucky to live to adulthood here. He recalled his 45th life. How he used to hit on beautiful girls in bars. They told him that it would be a 10-minute affair, but he heard girls singing and shoes clicking. He turned around and was frightened by the sound. A trailer girl bursts into his room. She looks toward the fireplace. There is no one there. She looks at the window with the curtains. No one there. She walks around his room looking for Arel. But she noticed his boots sticking out under the curtains and pretended to believe that there was no one in the room. The princess abruptly opens the curtain and Arel stands there angrier than ever. The princess offered to play hide and seek and Arel was desperate. Of course, he didn't want to play. The princess pulled Arel by the hand and led him to another place. Arel was in the opposite mood of joy. They played in the yard. The princess had found the prince. Now it was his turn to look for her. After Fenelia's visit, Princess Kania became a frequent visitor. Of course, not without the help of the ubiquitous nanny. This is not a bad thing, if only because there will be a strong friendship between his mother and the princess's mother. The princess stood over Arel and was sure that she could easily take care of him. She took his hand and asked Arel to come to her when he grew up. He was tired of the obsessive princess. He was distracted from his thoughts again by Kanaya, who said that she adored him. She compared the prince to some Leonid and Meryl, who were not as fun as him. For her, he was the best option. Arel thought that she would regret those words as soon as he got older. Kanya picked the prince up and dragged him to play somewhere else. Arel was suffocating from the princess's grip and begged for help. Kanya's maid became his rescuer because she said that the child was in pain. And Kanya herself was too young to carry anything heavy. The maidservant Kanya became an angel to Arel. He ran to the maid's foot. The princess was naughty because she wanted to play. The maid offered to paint or listen to classical music. This upset Kania because it seemed boring to her. The maid questioned her about what she wanted to do. Kania waved her head around. She picked up a branch from the ground. She waved it joyfully like a sword, and Kania saw her brother Kyle doing it. Arel was judging her poor swordsmanship. He missed this activity. Kania pretended to knock someone down with her sword and win. The maid told her, that this was not a girlish thing to do. This surprised the children. Kanya was even more angry, wondering why it was okay for her brothers, but not for the princess. The maid continued to explain with determination. She asked Kanayu not to argue, 
because the most important thing for a princess is femininity and elegance. The sword disappeared from the maid's back. She was running after the princess, who had stolen it, and wanted to practice fencing. Arel was following this chase. And at this point, the princess began to like Arel. Time passed in the kingdom. Summer passed. Winter passed. Summer came again. Birds sang in the sunny sky. People rode their horses across the kingdom's lawn. Meanwhile, Arel turned five years old. He was also riding a horse. Loudly and confidently, he rode a horse. But only a toy horse, because he was still five years old. He refused the nani's offer to ride a real horse. The nani said that boys of his age are interested in horses and swords. But for him, princes on a white horse were not in fashion. This disappointed the nanny. He cried and demanded water. Out of all the lives he had lived, Aurel hadn't learned one thing, how to prove people wrong. He reached the top in fencing, competing against many opponents. He also excelled in magic, burning away all obstacles in his path. Every skill that he had undertaken to develop in his past lives he had trained to perfection. And now, he didn't even have anything to do. When the nani knocked on his room, Arel rudely asked her to leave him alone. Of course, she obeyed him. She wished him a good day at work. But Arel was lying in a big bed, and work is for fools. Someone came into the room. It was the nani who came to talk to Arel. She stood with a humble face in front of the sad prince. Tears were welling up in Arel's eyes. He tried to calm down. He didn't want to cry. Arel sat down in a chair, and the nurse leaned toward him. She did not understand the prince. Arel did not want to learn so much. The nurse explained to the prince the importance of learning for him. But Arel was not interested. He did not want to learn something new. The nani said, that he was thinking as if he had lived one hundred lives. Arel was scared, wondering how she could know that. He made excuses. The prince leaned on the armrest and said that science had already gotten to him. Arel was tired of studying and learning all his life. But the nani explained that, according to the imperial law, five years was the age to start learning. The nani put six books on his desk. Arel was desperate. He took the books in his hand. He started to spin them like a baseball. While the nani explained that knowledge is a valuable resource that not everyone can even read, Arel was building a house of books. It fell apart. The nani shouted that books should be respected. She told him to sit up straight and not to be naughty. The prince thought about getting rid of her as soon as possible. Eureka! He started screaming as he lay on the floor. He waved his legs and arms, crying that he would not study. The door of the room opened. His mother was standing in the hallway with a smile on her face. Seeing her, Arel calmed down and accepted his fate. The nani and Arel's student were in the library. He was flipping through a book. The prince understood that he had to learn, but ironically, the more he tried, the more he endangered the people around him. The more talented the son of a concubine and an emperor, the more people would want to kill him. People walked the streets in the kingdom, and Arel continued to philosophize about fate. He folded his hands in front of the table and resigned himself. The nani brought tea to the prince and asked him to study hard so that his mother would be happy. Arel reached for the mug. Looking down, he said that he was too lazy for that. But the nani was pushy. She pressured him with Mrs. Lafana's emotions. And it worked. He didn't want to let his mom down, so he agreed to study, to learn everything except fencing. And fencing. He wondered who he would grow up to be without it. In his notebook, Arel continued to draw his squiggles. A week later, a carriage arrived in the kingdom. Arel was frightened and pulled back the curtain to look out the window. It was a magician from the tower who had come to help the prince with his studies of magic. The information from the nanny shocked the prince. Arel shouted that he did not want to be a magician. He was worried that this magician would feel his power. He had accumulated an incredible amount of energy over the years. The prince had to hide his powers. His feet stomped sadly along the corridor. He walked and radiated a huge plume of energy while his nani calmed him down 
and convinced him that everything would be quick and painless. The door opened. The Nani and Arel were in the passage. In front of them was a man sitting at a table drinking tea. The magician was incredibly surprised and looked at the prince. They were standing opposite each other. Arel could feel the energy flowing through his body. He wondered how the magician had seen him. He took the prince's hand in surprise. The Nani behind him hoped for the prince's uniqueness. But the magician did not take his eyes off Arel. He was unpleasantly surprised. Arel pretended not to understand. But the magician did not feel a single gram of mana in him. The magician stood back up and scratched the back of his head awkwardly. The Nani was surprised that the man did not find anything magical in the prince. Arel sat triumphantly in his chair. As he walked down the corridor, he carefully restrained the circulation of magical energy. Then, in the moment, he managed to concentrate it in one point. Arel squeezed his mana and released the energy outward. And when Arel saw the magician's surprised face, he breathed out a sigh of relief. He did not see the mana, and he could not have, because it was gone. Mrs. Lafania was confused by this news. The fact that he did not find a single drop of mana in the prince's body had its drawbacks. Because even commoners often have at least a small drop of mana, which the prince did not have. Arel listened to the conversation between the magician and his mother, and did not understand whether he was doing the right thing. He turned to his mother. She was disappointed to hear that. Arel felt guilty. He didn't want to see his mother upset, but he needed everyone to think he was weak. Arel cried out of guilt. He was just starting to do his job. A cheerful red-headed man stood in the street. He was Arel's mentor. He said motivational things with incredible positivity. But this thirty-five-year-old Nike did not surprise him. Arel knew that this guy was a weakling, and he was still far from being a real knight. In his past lives, Arel had participated in numerous battles and fought the most terrible monsters, like a huge snake. He had cut the body of this monster in two. That mentor was not an example for him. But he was ready to learn. Arel was sure that Ranfield would not teach him anything new. But the coach was ready to teach the kids. He suggested starting with the basics. In the gray room, Arel saw Kanaya. She was wearing a kimono, and she was making the training more difficult with levers. This made the prince think. The trainer told the prince that for the Kansas family, this was the norm. Now Arel wanted to get down to business. The coach showed his skills outside. The basic things for fencing are flexibility and balance. Arel could not stand on the stump. His whole body was shaking. But he was on such a low stump that even if he fell, he could not get hurt. This was the first level of balance training. Arel was simply afraid of any height. The prince was no longer sitting on a stump. Now it was time for flexibility. He stretched his arms to the floor. But he leaned forward slightly. In a moment, they were standing by the scarecrow. Arel was with the sword and Ranfil said that they had to hit the target. It didn't go as planned. The accuracy training failed. His sword flew out of his hands. This was already upsetting Ranfil. Arel talked about his hopelessness. The coach calmed him down by patting him on the shoulder. You don't become a professional overnight. Ranfil gave the kid his sword. Arel felt that someone was watching him. A silhouette stood in the middle of the trees. He realized that the worse his progress, the sooner they would leave him behind. Rumors quickly spread throughout the kingdom. People talked about Arel's lack of mana. They even mocked him. The empress was told about his lack of talent for anything, and she was pleased with it. Rumors helped to mislead everyone, and Arel was an expert in this. In the kingdom, Arel wondered when the teacher would come. He was eating cookies, and his nani stood next to him and told him, that the teacher would be coming soon. Everyone around him in the kingdom said that he was useless. Almost all the teachers refused to teach him. But still, while Arel was eating his cookies, someone came. Arel and the Nani were distracted by someone knocking at the door. The prince saw a blue-haired man in a suit. It was Hamel Pernia, who became Arel's new teacher. He came to teach the prince foreign languages. Arel noticed a look of hopelessness in his face as if he was forced to teach a kid. 
the teacher threw the books on the table. He explained that they would help the prince with grammar in one day. Arel was surprised. The teacher said with a stone face that this was the usual pace and that every day there would be a new topic. The prince was already sitting at the books and with a disgruntled face agreed to try to study hard. But the teacher did not stop lecturing him about grades, learning, and skills. Arel did not understand why the teacher did not ask his opinion and hoped that he would not just ignore him in all the lessons. It was a deep night. The moonlight illuminated the books on the shelves of the library. The prince's slippered feet walked down the corridor. He was walking with a hatchet. Arel had learned many foreign languages in his past lives. He was confident in his linguistic abilities. The prince put the candlestick on the floor. He raised his hands toward the books and began to use magic. He wanted to find a dictionary. His mana reached the top shelf. He grabbed the grammar book with his magic. Arel was already floating in the air with the books. He picked up more foreign books. He waved his hand and picked up all the books. He arranged them on the table in columns. Arel picked up a book and started reading. Languages are created according to the same principle. And based on this, he wanted to wipe his teacher's nose with his knowledge. The thought made him furious. Arel knelt on the floor of the night library and read books. During the day, a carriage was parked outside the kingdom. In the room, Arel was studying and being scolded by his teacher. The teacher turned around and accused the prince of lying. He did not believe that Arel had learned all the material. Arel sighed. He was telling the truth. The teacher could not believe it, and the prince did not understand why he would lie. The native imperial language was more difficult than the languages of neighboring countries. The teacher ordered him to read the textbook. No matter how smart a child is, it is difficult to read even one simple book before the age of twelve. And here the five-year-old learned the language in just two days. The teacher opened the textbook. Arel took up the book and read enthusiastically in a foreign language. The teacher was shocked. His lips were pursed in confusion but his eyes were filled with joy and delight at what he heard. After all, when a student succeeds, the teacher's reputation grows. Arel was overjoyed. The teacher took a chair next to him and sat down with him. They continued to study together. Arel chose a safer path to realize himself in the higher world. Meanwhile, rumors were circulating in the kingdom about Arela, but now about his success in linguistics. At the table, the aristocrats assumed his knowledge of the exact sciences as well. These rumors spread quickly. The teacher sat in the bar and told everyone around him about Arel's talent. Over a glass of whiskey, his tongue got loose and many people heard about the prince's abilities. Finally, the emperor was informed of Arel's success. Mrs. Lyphania apologized to him for his failure in magic and fencing. She thought with sadness in her eyes about her son's changes. She had doubts about the methods of education. The emperor asked her if she was worried about her son. He believed that Arel was growing up to be a wonderful boy. These words made Lafana blossom. The emperor approached Lafana and gently hugged her waist. Arel was going to surprise everyone even more, but he wanted to do it in a measured way to keep people interested in his person. The prince happily flew up to the bed and decided to rest. After all, he was a genius now. A few days later, knights gathered outside the kingdom. They stood in two lines, led by a red-haired man. Arel watched them through the window. It must have been the emperor's idea to give them protection in the form of knights. The prince was happy to see such a caring father. He was startled by a sharp knock on the door. Two maids came in and brought a heavy chest. Mrs. Lafania was also there, and she told him, that these were gifts from the emperor. Arel approached the box and was surprised. Mrs. Lafana and the maids were waiting for him to open his gift. Arel was amazed at what he saw. The box contained a huge amount of precious stones. The prince sorted through the gold and jewelry that burned his eyes with its brightness. He picked up a pendant with a large gemstone. Lafana and the maids were happy that he liked the gift, but he was interested in the pendant. He suspected that the pendant could help him to focus and activate his mental abilities. 
but most likely it just melts brains. The Nani was glad that Arel was so smart. This smart guy focused on the precious pendant that had mana inside the stone. He did not need this mana. He thought of Kanya. She had been training hard lately. The prince picked up the pendant and asked if he could give it to his sister. The mother came to the child and gave her permission. Arel told his mother that what he liked about Kanya was that she was very strong. It was a happy day for everyone in the castle because the emperor had made a generous gift. It was an honor for the knights to defend the concubine's castle. Meanwhile, everything was calm in the kingdom's tower. Arel was sitting at the dining room table, which was lavishly laid out with desserts from the chef. Arel tasted the chocolate chip cookies, but they were not good. He tasted it, but it was not right. The nani advised him to slow down, because Arel's cheeks were almost bursting from the amount of cookies. The prince disliked cookies because of their low sugar content. The nani suggested calling the chef because he was very upset. Suddenly, Arel turned to the nani and asked her to call the alchemist. He was desperate for Coca-Cola, which of course they didn't have. So he wanted to recreate the taste of this nightboy. The nani did not understand the need for an alchemist. Arel didn't know how to explain it. He wondered how to justify his desire, since he was only five years old. The prince looked at the whole table of tasteless desserts and realized that he could not do without the help of an alchemist. But still, there were no technologies in this world that could help him get the taste of cola. Rivers of tears poured from his eyes because of the hopelessness. His desire for a cool soda was too much. But Arel is still a genius so he will take matters into his own hands. The prince abruptly got up from the table. He ran towards the door and shouted to the nanny that he was running to study. This surprised the nanny. Arel ran down the hall. He realized that cooking is chemistry, so he definitely needed an alchemist. He was determined to try to recreate the taste of cola. Time passed. Autumn. Summer. Three years later, Arel was already eight years old. There was a meeting of the elders in the kingdom. They were planning to build new bridges in areas where traders were actively traveling. Prince Arel was sitting with them, holding a piece of paper. He was asked for his opinion on this while he was looking at the design. He was interested in the idea. The prince asked who designed the bridge. A sly smile appeared on his face. A man in a black suit happily exclaimed that he was the author. His face changed dramatically when the prince said that the next time he brought such a crap, he would be fired. Arel was pointing at a bad miscalculation in the main part of the bridge, which would collapse when the snow accumulated in the winter. Arel noticed their desire to surprise everyone with decorations and pretentiousness without thinking about the functionality of the bridge. The prince shouted out loudly for the author of the project to finish it. He frighteningly agreed to fix it. Arel continued to look through the project sheets. Because of his extensive knowledge, the prince was overwhelmed with work. He only advised adults and serious ministers, using his knowledge of technology from his previous lives. The eight-year-old advising officials was a comedy. The author of the project wiped the sweat from his face with excitement. Where would they go without Arel? Now was the time for him to demonstrate his skills. All sorts of negotiations continued in the kingdom. A maid was walking down the hall with a basket. She saw Arel walking down the hallway in his imperial garb. He looked magnificent. Someone behind him called out to him that he was a silver-haired sage. He turned around in confusion at this silly nickname. This new maid apologized for saying that and bowed her head to him. The prince asked her not to call him by that name anymore. She agreed in a moment and accidentally called him silver-haired again. It annoyed him. People made up this stupid nickname for him. They even called him that in the carriage. Arel had already covered his ears to avoid hearing the words. The wheels began to move. The carriage was leaving the kingdom. Mrs. Lafania saw through the window that Arel had left. She asked Nani Sina where he was going. She explained that he had gone to have an audience with the emperor. This only added to the mom's confusion. The nani tried to explain awkwardly. The prince stood in the emperor's office, bent his head, and said that he wanted to study alchemy. 
Even when Arel was riding back in the carriage, he remembered the face of the ruler. Arel was allowed to study alchemy. The prince must have worked hard for the empire. He continued to think about the meeting as he looked out the carriage window. He was nervous about the meeting. After all, he had to persuade the emperor as nicely as possible, and at the same time without being intrusive. The carriage was already approaching the kingdom. Guards were standing at the door of the emperor's office. They could hear the conversation between the prince and the ruler, who asked why he needed alchemy. He assured him that since the prince had no talent for magic and fencing, only science remained for him. The emperor thought about it for a while, and he really believed that his mind was a really valuable resource. The ruler agreed to provide the prince with an alchemy teacher and asked if he needed anything else. Aurel said that was it. They were both pleased with the outcome of the conversation and looked at each other with incredible confidence. There were many candidates for the prince's teacher. They realized that this was their chance to make a contribution to history. The test task was to create a mirror that could reflect light to the horizon. This task was not for everyone, and there were even fatalities. But after a while, there was a man who did the job perfectly. He was a white-haired guy named Darman Longet. He looked quite pleased. Arella was expecting an old fart, so he was surprised to see this young man. They stood next to the white columns. The prince marveled at the teacher's hair. He touched his bangs, and his hair turned white due to a lot of experiments. Arel mockingly asked him how he was still alive, since he was constantly smelling chemicals. They continued to talk. Arel noticed that he was quite calm, but he thought it was a mask. Alchemy is a serious thing. If the prince were to injure himself or die during his experiments, there would be no one to blame. Darman Lagnet had already said in earnest that it was a dangerous occupation for which one could pay a very high price. Aurel confidently shook hands with the teacher and replied that he understood all the risks. The prince said he understood that this was not magic and did not expect to be taught how to make gold from lead, but he wanted to explore metal alloys and find the strongest one, or create a material that would make construction easier. These words pleasantly surprised the teacher. Immediately afterwards, Darman realized that the rumors about the prince's uniqueness were true. He was indeed a genius who would lead the empire. The teacher sat down to be on equal footing with him and supported Arel's wishes, promising to teach the prince everything he knew. A few days had passed since the beginning of the alchemy lessons. There were flasks with different liquids on the table in the study. Darman Longet and Prince Arel stood in the classroom and did experiments. The teacher asked if the prince had studied alchemy on his own. Arel was frightened. Was it really that obvious? Arel wrote notes in his notebook and dropped the phrase that he had just read a few books. He accepted this answer and was happy to see once again that the rumors were true. Arel continued to write something down and dismissed the idea that the teacher was suspicious. Time passed. It was already sunset outside. They continued to experiment. Arel wanted to add either shells or bones to make the iron alloys stronger. On the table was a notebook with notes and sketches on alchemy. Arel learned how to extract lead and other chemicals. With the exception of metalla and medicines, everything else was identical to what he already knew. He shouted the phrase out loud with joy. Darman did not understand what Arel meant. But Arel pretended that he was talking to himself, even though he was embarrassed. Everything was going well, and according to plan. A man was riding through the woods. He left his horse near the palace and two guards. The emperor received a petition from Prince Arella. He sat on a red throne and looked at the letter, which stated Arel's desire to expand the staff to four alchemists. The emperor ordered to gather the best alchemists in the empire. The messenger expressed his concern to the emperor. He did not understand what he would do with the alchemists. They were spending the empire's budget on layers of research, and because of this, questions from the people might begin. The emperor's hand rested on his chair. He was silent and remembered what Arel had told him when he came to him with a request. Prince Arel was doing this for the sake of the empire. At the meeting, Arel announced to everyone that he wanted to make a drink. 
This news surprised everyone present, including the teacher. The man who had recently made a bad bridge project clarified this desire. Arel enthusiastically told all five of them about it. He had a plan to help popularize this invention. During his explanation, everyone present became disappointed. With sad eyes, they did not understand why such a smart boy was wasting his energy on a drink. Some of the people at the table were even regretting changing jobs. Arel's fingers went up in the air. He flipped a coin, which was followed by the entire surprise table. Arel quickly picked it up and showed everyone the coin with the eagle. The prince promised that he would pay more than enough. It didn't matter if he succeeded or not. One man coughed and was ready to answer. Another man clapped his hands in embarrassment at the fake excitement. Another said that the development with carbonated sweet water already exists. Another noticed that the prince wanted something of his own. Arel stood by them contentedly and confessed that they would do their best. Money and fame are good motivation. That's why he was already eager to create a great soda. The carriage was on its way to the kingdom. It was carrying mineral water from abroad. People were carrying barrels to the door. Several barrels were standing in front of Arel and the others. These were the first samples. Teacher Darman went to the barrel and opened it. He was a bit in doubt. There was a strange smell coming from it, a black color. Arel came over to check it out and agreed that it was not to be drunk yet. Arel covered his face from this strange liquid. He looked at this horror. He wanted to come up with some solution. Everyone around him was waiting with the same frightened face. The prince turned to the men and decided with confidence that since the natural soda didn't work, they would try to make an unnatural soda. This surprised everyone around him. Arel handed out post-it notes to the entire commission, on which he wrote down his theory, which he would like to discuss at the next meeting. They were sickened by what they read. Arel happily asked about the alchemists and how professional they were. Teacher Darman said that they were the best alchemists in the empire of Arnesia. The prince, dancing to the exit of the meeting room, said that it was time to test the theory in practice. He threw in that they had a week to do it and quickly disappeared. Arel walked away with his hands behind his head, hoping that this would be a good motivation for them. A week passed. The kingdom was loud. Arel presented a discovery that would turn the Arnesian Empire upside down. The trend of the season was soda. The five of them stood in a room with five containers of colored liquids on the table. Arel doubted very much that this attempt would be even close to the truth. He gladly picked up the flask with the blue venom and offered to taste it. His teacher and his husband were not enthusiastic about this offer. But Arel put his palms together and asked for their trust. The nani walked away with a tray while Arel talked about mixing the liquid with fruit juice or alcohol. The primary goal was cola. But at this stage, that was unlikely to be possible. Chin brought the tray over and put it on the table. Arel took a glass of lemon juice and poured it into the flask. He tasted the drink quite boldly, closing his eyes. The prince's face shone with pleasure. The drink was very tasty. Now each man took a flask in his hand, and they all took a drink and began to taste it. The men's faces were on the verge of shock and incredible delight. Their receptors were going crazy, making them sweat with pleasure. This is how Prince Arella's lemonade was born, which quickly gained popularity and spread even beyond the borders of the empire. This drink was elite and expensive. It was even sold on the streets and was loved by adults and children alike. Lemonade fell into the hands of a man who was very surprised that the prince had created the drink. This man was Count de Mint, lord of the northern part of the empire. The lord explained that the prince had indeed led the process of creating the drink, which became extremely popular. It was a great contribution to the economy of the empire. There were rumors that wagons with gold were constantly coming to the concubine's castle. The lord was overcome with envy. He recalled their first meeting at a birthday party, when he held the baby in his hands and did not suspect the child's genius. The count was upset and banged on the table, which made the assistant embarrassed. The sounds of envy and regret were heard in the Lord's night study. A lion's sword sliced through the fresh air. 
it was Princess Kaliya, practicing her Sakura, moving almost at the speed of light. She was already sixteen years old. Kaliya had already matured and become serious. Arel was delighted with his sister's skills. Meanwhile, his brother was already ten years old. Kanya's assistant was also there. They both spoke positively about the princess's skills. Arel was proud that her skills surpassed those of most boys her age. Kanya, hearing many compliments, jumped for joy. She was advised to take a break. The prince and princess sat down on the table, with an assistant standing next to them. They started talking about Arella. She mentioned the popularity of the lemonade, and the prince was happy to hear it. Kanya, resting her head on her hand, said enchantedly that he was the perfect son of the emperor, and the words that many people would envy Ms. Lafani changed his face. Lafana dedicated the development of the carbonated drink to his mother, Lafana Einrest. This family used to belong to the nobility, but quickly became impoverished. The family was no longer the same. The title remained, but life was like that of a commoner. And when Arel learned about his mother's fate, he allocated a share in the business. And not for nothing. Crowds of people were standing behind the soda. They had to be shouting to line up at the kiosk. Everyone wanted lemonade and more of it. The boys were carrying those boxes, replenishing the shelves, and people were already quarreling when there was not enough lemonade for everyone. Then Arel was able to create yogurt and monosodium glutamate, which quickly became best sellers. The family's finances skyrocketed, and no other company could match them. The entire palace shone with luxury that blinded the eyes. Arel told this story to his sister, who had a strange reaction. The prince stood up to bring the princess lemonade and waffles and syrup, but he was stopped by the coldness of the sword in front of his face, which frightened him. Arel had never learned fencing, so Kenya decided to teach him and put a sword in the prince's hands. He was not very happy about it. Outwardly, he seemed to be happy with this offer, but inwardly, he was remembering his past life when he was a master. K. Ya immediately attacked Prince Arella with a deadly attack. The battle began. They swung their swords on the lawn. Arel defended himself ineptly, while Kalia taught him combinations. He thought that if he didn't show interest, she would quickly leave him. The princess was skillful. She had a great desire to become a better warrior, and the confident way she held her sword in her hands drove the little girl, who soon became strong. They continued their training. Arel looked more interested and skillfully dodged her sword. He decided to use some mana to resist Kanya. The training continued. A carriage was moving through the city. People in the street shouted the prince's name and were happy to see him. Arel looked out of the carriage at the people and felt like a star. He was accompanied by knights on horseback. He leaned back on the sofa in the carriage and began to think. Arel wondered why he had been summoned. He put his fingers to his face and continued to ride. Perhaps they wanted to reward him for the work he had done. Arel sat at the same long table as the emperor. There were many desserts on the prince's side. Arel used to be embarrassed by his father's silence, but now he is used to it. While he was silent, the prince tasted cookies with tea. He was very used to it, so he felt at home there. The prince coughed at the sudden offer to give Arella a full-fledged government position. He quickly shook himself out of his state of shock and pretended not to be surprised. Of course, the emperor clarified that it might take some time, but no one would be against such a change. Arel said that this was unnecessary, but inside he was shocked, screaming, and afraid. Arel was not yet ready for life in the palace and for responsibility. In another attempt to calm down, he took a sip of tea. He put the mug down and threw out a pompous phrase about not knowing how to respond to such a generous offer. He was unsure because he had a lot more to explore in alchemy. The emperor remained silent. Arel imagined himself in office. He remembered the empress and the heir to the throne, who had been acting unremarkable lately. So he kept his distance. He only did all kinds of research with his teacher, mixing different liquids. That's why no one sees him as a threat. He continued to sit at the table and think about the difference between attracting attention and fighting for the throne. 
the prince was not ready. But perhaps the emperor was just provoking him. At the other end of the table sat a serious emperor, crossing his arms in front of him. Natural selection exists not only in the animal world. The human world has its own birds that die without ever taking off. Aurel tensed up. He didn't need to think about life and death. He didn't need anything. It hadn't interested the prince for a long time. It was a sunny day. Prince Aurel was riding in the meadow. It was the first time he had ever been so far away from the castle. It was a freedom for him. He had been working very hard lately. Aurel's desk was filled with all kinds of papers. He never thought he would turn into office plankton. In his past lives, he used to wander the world with his bazooka hands, fancy hairstyle, and glasses in search of a stronger opponent. He rode a horse and enjoyed his freedom. This walk was only possible thanks to Princess Kalia. She asked him to take his time, and Kalia noticed the prince's abilities. Aurel is good, of course, but Kalia is no slouch either. Suddenly the prince turned nervously to his sister. He wondered why a whole squad was running after them. Their faces were so tense, as if they had the ability to cure constipation with that look. Kalia said they didn't need anyone. Aurel laughed. Clearly, he was the cause of so much constipation. Suddenly, he asked his sister to stop in fright. Aurel saw an incomprehensible energy in the forest further away. It seemed to him that there was a monster there, and the princess did not understand him. The prince was confident in his guesses, so he asked Kalia to set traps. Suddenly, she shouted to everyone to go forward. This puzzled the prince. He asked the passing guards to tell the princess that it was dangerous. But he was assured by one of the boys who came back and said that she was using the forest for training. Aurel was frightened by the information. Kalia was at the front of the column, waving her sword and calling out to the prince. The prince sounded very confused. Recalling some time ago, during a lunch together, Kalia had invited him to go horseback riding. Aurel was surprised but he was really too tired to sit in the castle all day and work, as the princess said, while drinking tea. It was a trap plan. Kalia was glad she had dragged him to practice, but the prince was not happy at all. The princess was pleased that despite the danger, Aurel went with her. They both had a pleasant smile on their faces. Silly Kalia, but she has a lot of courage. They could hear screams in the forest. The prince had a plan. He was pointing with a stick on the map to where some of the knights would act as bait. Behind him was his strike force. He wanted Kanya and the others to go to the rear and fight the monsters. In a short time, they had to destroy as many monsters as possible, and then Kanya would take care of the rest. Twenty big green orcs were on the way. Kanya pulls out her sword. The first blow to the orc with incredible strength. The second orc the second blow. The prince saw these monsters for the first time, they were huge. But Kanya was cooler. She knocked down those orcs with incredible speed, her reflexes were amazing. She flew like an arrow. Everyone around her was cheering for her. Aurel calmly watched his sister. She was killing those orcs until nightfall. The training session was over. Kalia and Aurel sat by the fire. They talked about the day. At the same time, they were grilling sausages. Aurel asked her to be careful. He said this remembering his previous life when he paid with his life for not being careful. They were eating fried sausages. Aurel admired his sister. The fire was burning orange. And suddenly, for Kanya, Aurel asked her why she wanted to become stronger. It made her think. She had always been told that she was a princess, that swinging a sword was not a girl's thing like she's going to marry a man she doesn't even know. This created a tense atmosphere around the fire. In this world, it was the norm for aristocrats to marry in a calculated manner. Their faces were focused. In any case, one would have to marry to keep the family afloat. And Kanaya hated the thought. She wanted to live like Aurel. This surprised him greatly. The princess had ambitions to make money and a secondary income from what she was good at. She wanted to work for the good of the empire and be recognized by people. The sword was at her feet as she explained her feelings to Aurel. 
She wanted to be recognized. She wanted to glorify her family not by marriage, but by achievements that no one could deny. Kalia said with fire in her eyes that she wanted to decide her own fate. Arel was glad to hear that. He thought she was on the right track. These words made Kalia smile. They would return to the castle at dawn. And while Arel was thanking his sister for the interesting experience, something strange flew in the sky. It looked more like a yellow-green dragon. Leaves were flying off the tree. It was an orc who grabbed it in his giant hands. Kanya was attacking him. The orcs she had defeated were lying on the ground. The two boys were discussing this with some fear that it would be better to leave it to her. The princess felled the orcs one by one. Already covered in blood and mud, Kanaya heard her brother's voice asking her to finish. They had to hurry to get back in time. The fight was over anyway. All the orcs were already lying on the ground with no signs of life. Putting her sword on her shoulder, she agreed to go back. The princess's horse looked tired. Arel thought that he was most likely frozen, so he suggested that they not touch him, but sit on his stallion together. The assistant said that the doctors would examine her horse, and Kanaya agreed, stroking the horse's face. She put her feet into the, and expressed her desire to control the horse. Kanya sat behind the prince, who was not against this initiative. They rode off, with many other attendants behind them. They cut through the air at high speed and at some point Arel looked up at the sky in fright. He saw a strange trail of pink-colored energy. He felt an aura. Someone was hiding behind the clouds. A strange shadow was approaching from there, and from this aura a green creature with horns began to appear. It was Wyvern. Arel snatched the reins from his sister and told her to hold on tight. The horse reared up on two hooves. The prince shouted to the attendants that Wyvern was on top of them, and that they should scatter one by one. This confused the attendants. No one had seen anything. They decided to remind the prince that they were in a training area. While one of them was saying that there was no wyvern here, his shoulder was almost touched by the paw of this monster. He grabbed the man into the sky, and everyone around him started screaming in fear. There were several werewolves in the sky, one of which grabbed the attendant. Everyone started screaming in different directions. Kanya did not understand where they came from in such numbers. Arel turned around to look at the situation, which turned out to be deplorable. The whole flock was in the sky. They continued to grab people. Some tried to fight them off with swords. The wyverns were running after everyone who got in their way. They grabbed people with their huge paws with sharp claws. It was not just a hunt. It was a slaughter. From their jaws they exhaled poisonous gas that made you cough. They were already strong. Arel did not understand why they were made to be poisonous. Kania watched in fright as the wyverns killed her soldiers. Dead soldiers were already lying on the ground. Arel ordered his sister not to be distracted. The wyvern flew after them. The creature was spewing gas from its stinking mouth. Behind Arel and Kania's horse, a mage appeared, distracting wyvern with a fireball. There were several of them, and their task was to protect the princess. The fireball was engulfing wyvern. Arel realized that it would be almost impossible to hide. Since wyverns were quite resistant to magic, most magicians could not even scratch them. This monster made incredibly loud noises. The wyverns continued to chase the prince and princess. Arel realized that there was no way out. He pointed his mana-radiating hand toward the wyverns. The prince hit the monster's face. The second one hit him in the belly. He felled them both. Kanya thanked the magicians, who were confused by this. A monster landed in front of Kanya and Arel. They were both frightened. Wyvern was too close to the children. But they were rescued, and Wyvern's stomach was cut. It was a guard. She shouted to them to run to a safe place. They looked at the guard with delight. They ran into the forest. Behind them, the fight with the wyverns continued. Out of nowhere, they heard someone's terrible voice calling the miserable people. Arel turned his head in fright to find the source of the sound. It was someone in a robe. In his hands was a magic wand as tall as he was. Arel asked who he was. The prince thought the wand was suspicious. It had blue spheres on it. 
Arel shouted at him, asking what he wanted from them. The man stood calmly, with a sly smile. The stick began to glow. A beam of energy flew out of it. Arel's eyes reflected this bright light. He did not understand what was happening. The attack continued. These rays were flying at the knights like lasers. The prince turned to them with fear. Many were already lying dead and crippled on the ground. Smoke was coming from the soldiers after the blows. That mage knew Kania. This frightened Arel. It turned out that he was aiming at the princess. His face was terrifying. For him, it was entertainment. He had a cannibalistic smile on his face. He raised his huge stick. Arel did not like the black aura that radiated from it. A pillar of this aura rose into the sky. The princess cried out in fear to Arela. The soldiers rose from the dead thanks to the black energy. It was as if they had become the walking dead. The wyvern approached another guard. The zombies stood in front of the prince. A magician in a robe waved his stick and ordered the princess to be killed. His words were full of hatred for the people on the throne. These walking dead obeyed him. In a moment, the magician seemed to be frightened. Arel realized that the creature had come for the princess's soul. He radiated his mana and hit the monster in the cloak. Holes were created in its body. Princess Kalia did not understand what had happened. The magician fell to the ground with his limbs torn off. Arel made up fairy tales for her and said that it was the result of his personal magic. The werewolves and the walking dead continued to attack the humans, despite the death of the magician. They did not understand why this happened, but it seemed to Arel that this spell worked for a certain time. Arel decided to run away while the slaughter was going on. They ran into the forest and sat on the ground. The princess wondered what would happen next. Arel said that if the leader was dead, then his men on foot would soon die as well. He reassured the princess and said that the soldiers were probably already looking for them. At the same time, the prince was trying to make a fire. The princess was surprised by his knowledge, and he joked that he just knew how to use the power of friction from books. Actually, Arel was going to use mana for the fire, but Khalil was watching his movements closely. His hands had barely made the fire, and even the prince was surprised. It was burning brightly. Khalil sat with her arms folded and regretted what had happened. Arel tried to calm her down. The princess wondered if he was afraid. She clearly felt guilty. Arel was shaking in front of the press and said that he was very scared and that the wyverns were very scary. The thought that Arel was also afraid calmed her down. The princess put her hand on his arm. She thanked her brother. Thanks to him, everything was not as terrible as it could have been. The prince did not even notice this. The princess was shaking and thanked him again. Arel did not notice that the princess was so afraid. On the battlefield, most of the attendants died defending their lives. The imperial family is always under the gun, and this was the first time her sister had experienced it for herself. The princess leaned over and hugged Arel. Arel on her shoulder thought that they still had to get home in one piece. They had to be careful. They saw a fight in the sky above the slope. It was Griffin and Wyvern. The kids were shocked. The griffin looked like an eagle. There was a griffin's nest with little birds on this rock. Most likely, the wyvern was hunting for the baby griffin. The wyvern grabbed the griffin's head with its mouth. The griffin hit the rock with the baby bird on it. It began to fall to the ground, and stones fell from the rock. The prince and the princess began to run away from the rockfall. There was a loud crash. Dust rose and made Arel and Kalia cough. The wyvern flew away. Apparently the wyvern blood on their bodies prevented them from being sniffed out. Arel looked around and noticed that the princess had disappeared. The princess was next to the griffin. Arel shouted to her that it was dangerous. But the griffin was dead. Kalia was kneeling in front of the bird. Arel did not understand why she did not listen to him. The princess was thinking about what to do with the griffin, which was lying stone to death. The princess stood there sad. Arel hoped she did not want to dig it up and bury it. The princess turned to Arel. 
she was holding a small griffin chick in her arms. She wondered what to do with it. Arel was dumbfounded by this living bird. Arel looked closely at the baby griffin. The prince did not want to do this, but he had no choice. The princess with a twinkle in her, I really wanted to take him. Arel was not happy about this idea. The emperor had a smile on his face because now, after the gift, the prince had finally shown interest in fencing. The emperor and Lady Lefania suddenly looked worried. Arel lost his grip on the sword and fell with a thud. He lay happily on the floor, crushed by his sword. After all, even if he had a talent for swordsmanship, he did not want to show it, not to fight for power. He did not want that. Arel stood up and expressed his gratitude for the gift, adding his disappointment that he could not appreciate it fully. With puppyish eyes, he said that this sword was more suitable for Cania. These words shook the princess. Arel thought her strength was incredible, barely inferior to the imperial knights. It was enough to be considered elite, but she was still far from Arel. Princess Kanzia destroyed training dolls at the speed of light. Arel thought that she had every chance of becoming one of the thirty best imperial knights. Her talent deserved to be recognized. Kanya's abilities made the other knights feel sad and doubt their strength. Arel approached the princess and handed her this sword. She was very surprised by this. The emperor was a little confused by this decision, but he accepted it. Only on the condition that Princess Kania show her abilities. This shocked them. Arel had forgotten that the emperor was a duck fencing obsessive. It was enough for him that Kania at least touched the emperor with her sword. Fear appeared on the princess's face. Arel patted his sister on the back, trying to encourage her. The prince was sure that she would touch his soul with that sword. And outwardly, he just gave a thumbs up. His support helped the princess. The emperor and Kanaya stood opposite each other with swords. He saw her confident stance, but it was not enough for him. Kania kept herself in check. Arel noticed that the emperor was judging the princess by her appearance. But Kania was serious. She raised her sword to her face, which reflected the emperor's calm face. The princess ran with incredible speed to the opponent. Behind the pleased prince, there was a confused Mrs. Lefania. The wind rose from Kania's speed. The prince appreciated her skills at the highest level. Kania cut the space in half. But she made a mistake that caused Lefania to cover her mouth with both hands in anticipation. The princess was flying at the emperor's forehead, as he expected. The sword was already at his side. But his smile only grew bigger. A few centimeters separated the sword from the emperor. The princess had been in the air during the attack which the emperor had repelled by raising his sword upward. Kania's face was terrified. The emperor easily managed to stop the princess. It was a strong blow, but not enough. Kania fell back to the floor, her sword falling beside her. The emperor had never seen such an aura in a child, only in a knight commander. He praised Kania. She held her shoulder in pain, but it was not over. The emperor said, that he had heard that Arel had helped Kania with fencing. The prince confirmed this information, happily clarifying that he was testing a theory that worked perfectly. It was a book that talked about increasing a fighter's potential, and Kania, as the owner of a magical aura, was the most suitable. This information made the emperor think. Arel suspected that his father was up to something. Perhaps it was about creating knights with aura and mass to create an invincible army that no one could match. Prince Arel bowed before the emperor and was going to disappoint him with the idea of an army of knights with aura. My sister initially had great potential because she had practiced a lot since she was a little girl. Thanks to her innate gift and perseverance, she managed to get this far. The prince said this with confidence and made the emperor agree. But in reality, anyone can be helped if you analyze their weaknesses and identify their strengths but it is too difficult to teach everyone individually. The prince imagined those naked ducks pushing and sweating. This was the last thing he wanted to see, a parade of testosterone. Of course, he realized that it would be suspicious to refuse outright. So he put on a thoughtful face and said that this method would only work for family members. 
This confused the emperor a bit. But Aurel hoped that he understood that no one can know whether they are using their knowledge against you or for you. A prince does not need to make his competitors stronger. The emperor raised his hand and agreed that this secret would be passed on only within the imperial family. Aurel was proud that his training method would be passed down from generation to generation. An imperial family with its own fighting style. It sounded wonderful. The thought made Aurel smile nervously. Now all the emperor's children would be forced to train hard. This was Aurel's chance as well. A month later, the two maids stood in a room that was in a frenzy filled with smoke. The naked emperor was sweating, and smoke was coming out of his mouth. He smashed the training dolls with his sword and stood there in shock. He had achieved the maximum effect of his training. The maid brought the sword to the emperor, who regretted that such a wonderful technique invented by Aurel could not be used by the author himself. With a towel around his shoulders, he reflected on how incredible the prince was and how useful he was to the empire. From the sunny royal garden came the surprised voice of the prince, who was eating cookies with Cania. Arella was asked to accompany him. Arella was told that he had to choose his escorts. The man had a huge pile of letters with the names of the candidates approved by the emperor. Arella was shocked at the number of candidates. Dot he continued to eat his cookies and began to look at this pile of paper. He spread them all over the dining room table. The prince saw that most of the noble families, who only a couple of years ago did not consider the prince to be a human being, were there. Arella had become popular. He leaned back in his chair, threw himself into his cookies, and accepted his fame. He thought he didn't need a bodyguard. With his hamster cheeks, he realized that he didn't want to show his strength so that his life wouldn't end as quickly as his past. Kanya jumped up and down with happiness. Arel looked at the candidates further and was about to randomly draw letters. But he was told that it would be better if the choice was more responsible. Arel looked at each candidate's resume carefully. But there were so many of them that he started to whimper. He caught the attention of her husband and Kanya. He didn't want to see the male candidates, so he chose the beautiful women. The man and Kanya looked at each other while Arel dug wildly into his resume. With glasses on his face and a pen in his hand, he put his feet up on the table and was ready to begin. The prince had no face. He shivered when he saw the candidates in the office. They looked rather stern and shouted at the prince. Arel could feel their strange aura. They were women, of course, but his ideas of pretty and gentle women were quickly shattered. The candidates noticed that Arel had turned pale, but he tried to keep it together. He exhaled and accepted the truth of life, that first-class knights do not look like a rose in the bushes. He put his dreams aside. Arel leaned over the table and announced that he was starting the interview. It was clear that these women were strong. The woman with the braids was the first to speak about herself. She shouted out her motivation to be a knight. Her energy filled the room. She was powerful. Arel realized that the emperor was obsessed with muscles, because this candidate whom the emperor had chosen would definitely protect Arel. He took a new resume. Another candidate came out who did not look as strong. She looked more like an aristocrat and was more feminine than the others. She had white hair, green eyes, and a small build. The interview with all the candidates was over. The prince needed to think, so he asked everyone to leave. They bowed to him and immediately slammed the door behind them. Prince Aurel had a difficult choice to make. He took a breath to concentrate. The prince released his inner energy and distributed it throughout his body. Blue light absorbed every corner of his body. It was a secret technique that stimulated the brain to make wise and correct decisions. This energy began to flow from his eyes. This ability was not easily activated. It required training and effort to achieve insight. The prince flew upward with this energy. And in an instant, he landed on the table. Arel was now ready to choose. He called the candidates. He used this ability for a reason, because he needed to understand the intentions of each knight who came to become his personal bodyguard. A woman with braids came in. Arel saw that she had dark intentions. 
The other one had the same. He did not need this. The choice continued. His eyes could see the inner world of a person. He didn't need a lie detector to distinguish the infidels. He could see the colors of their emotional background. He wrote notes in his notebook with a pen. Arel only needed those who wanted to become knights for his sake, so that it was their personal choice. The same girl with yellow hair and green eyes entered the office. He did not see a single dark spot. It was Ossia Pernil. The prince decided to read her biography more carefully. But he quickly dismissed the idea and decided not to worry, because she was wonderful. He continued the interview, which puzzled Ossia. But she would not be enough for him. He was thinking about a woman with incredible muscles. But suddenly another girl ran into the room. It was Saina Gallo, a girl with sharp teeth and a happy smile. Arel was surprised to see such a bright appearance. She seemed nice to him, but her aura confused him. He was also surprised to see that her resume showed that she had served abroad and had changed many nightly units. She laughed and said that she couldn't sit in one place. This made Arella think that she was just being kicked out of everywhere. But still, her aura was bright, and in principle, she fit his criteria. With a thumb up his nose, he decided that the reason for her transfer was her desire to travel, and that was all he needed to know. Arell announced with a smile on his face that the interview was over. He looked at the candidates and said that he would announce the results in a moment. Asia was a little surprised, and Sena with a huge smile after hearing that they were the ones chosen by Prince Arell. And that was it. Now the prince has his own personal knights. They were in the garden near the kingdom. On his right hand was Asia, and on his left was Sena who turned out to be serious when she was at work. Arel looked at them and decided to make a test for the girls. He brought them to a strange place in the yard. There was a strange wooden box there. He wanted to see all the possibilities of these knights. They were a little surprised by this. He realized that they could be strong, but the prince could make them even stronger. And for that he needed to test them. They leaned a little closer to the little prince and asked how he wanted to see their strength. With a twinkle in his eye, Arel suggested that they fight against each other. They were both even excited at the suggestion. Arel thought they were both on a level playing field. He sarcastically imagined the battle between these two beautiful women. He looked at them dreamily, looking forward to this action. The prince asked them who they thought was stronger. This question made them burst out in anger. They had nightly pride, no one wanted to lose. There was tension between Asia and Sena. Neither of them answered the question. The girls were looking at each other with intense gazes, and Arel was watching them, as if in a movie, wearing 3D glasses. He just missed the popcorn. The battle for the kingdom had begun. Sena stretched her arms. Asia stretched her legs. Sena asked about the rules, but Asia didn't think it was necessary. Arel was on the bench eating popcorn and thought that fighting without rules was the way to go. He asked them to just show their strength. Sena began to burn with the desire to show herself. Asia twirled her spear and was not going to hold back either. Here Arel got excited because it seemed like this fight would be to the death. He asked us not to overdo it. Arel raised his hands to each other and said that the beginning would be when he clapped his hands. Before the prince could give the start, the fight had already begun. He flew back with the bench and his popcorn. Asia and Sena had an incredible start to the fight. Arel landed near the stump and was dumbfounded by their frenzy. Well, these are knights. It's better to stay away from them. Arel began to assess their skills. Asa has quite powerful and wide attacks. If she hits the target, the opponent will have a hard time. But Sena is also not bad. Her eyes seemed to read Ace's movements in advance and dodge them on instinct. Sena found the moment. She attacked Asia with incredible speed and strength. Arel watched this happen. He realized that the closer the opponent was to Asia, the harder it was for him to attack in the same rhythm. He wondered how Asia would get out of this situation. Asia's face was tense. Her foot kicked Sena, making her twine in the air. 
Asia kicked Sena away. Se landed on the floor and expressed admiration for her spear and footwork. Asia twirled her weapon and said that a true knight is a weapon. Arel behind them was shocked. This was the beginning of some heart-to-heart -heart talk. Asia and Sena were like two beasts in a fight. It seemed to Arel that a little more and blood would be shed. It had to be stopped. When Sena and Asia were just centimeters away from each other, they were distracted by the prince's scream. He stopped them. He came closer and said that he had seen enough and realized what else needed to be done. This raised questions among the girls. Pointing his finger at Asia, he said that she was impatient. And Sena is limited in her attacks, so she chooses close combat. Asia remembered that he had trained Princess Kanaya and realized that they were now next in line. Arel said in all seriousness that after Kanaya added magic to her attacks, she became famous among the knights. So, of course, since they were his personal knights, he decided to help them become better. They were both very happy about it and agreed without question. The prince himself was happy to train such wonderful ladies. Arel, raising his hand to the mountain, walked forward, promising to help them achieve professionalism in knighthood. The girls behind him stood at attention and agreed. He ordered the knights to follow him to a special training camp. Arela's training camp. Lesson 1. Asia sat upright at her desk. Sena sat with her head propped up by her hand. Arel stood in front of the blackboard in his bathrobe, while Sena asked him how they would train their fighting skills in a schoolroom. He explained that this was where he would give lectures. The prince with glasses took out a book and said, that they had to start from the beginning to become stronger. It was his own book, The Way to the Top of the Art of Chivalry. If it helped them, he would sell it to others. The girls were shocked to read the book. Asia didn't understand the phrase, spread mana throughout the body, and Sena simply covered herself with the book to avoid misunderstanding. The world of theory was cruel to them. Arel picked up the chalk and began to explain the theory at the blackboard. He explained that the amount of mana is different for everyone. It can be more than for some people together, citing the example of knights, who have a small barrel for two mana, and Kania has more than enough mana. Arel showed in a drawing of a body that mana has its own cycle in the body, which can be adjusted so that with any amount of mana you can become stronger. Physical strength with the addition of the right amount of mana multiplies the potential and now it is just a waste of energy. The girls were interested in the consequences of mana containment, not just storage. The mana barrel would start to crack. Arel slapped the board for emphasis. He said that if you don't spend it, you can die. This frightened the girls, who had already imagined themselves dead from being overwhelmed with mana. But the prince was just joking. He was saying that we should accumulate mana, collect natural energy inside ourselves. An example of this energy was flying outside the window. It was a butterfly flying through a sunny garden and landing on a flower, radiating a plume of golden energy. Arel said that girls need to learn to accept and preserve natural energy, and then learn to use it. The prince put his hand on his heart and promised that even if they accumulated it, their opportunities would improve. Asia and Sena listened attentively to the teacher. The theory lesson was over. Arel pulled off his robe and walked with the girls to the exit. Arel's training camp. Lesson 2. Arel demanded that Sena feel his aura in her body. She raised her bent arm up and began to release her aura in it a little. Arel did not like that she was controlling it in one part of her body. She began to try to do it with both hands and control the aura all over her body. Sena was tense. She was disturbed by thoughts that were depressing her. Arel was watching her closely. Unfortunately, Sena sat down and gave up, trying to find excuses for not being able to do it. Arel did not accept her refusal. He smilingly held the hands of the bewildered knight to his own. He squeezed her hands, guiding her in the right direction. She was able to focus on the aura and feel it. After that, she redirected it to the point of contact with Arel's palms. She was doing well. She closed her eyes. The prince rejoiced at her success. Sena opened her eyes, 
and saw the successful result. After the success, she was pleased with the soft palms of the prince and continued to touch his hands. Meanwhile, Harel was not happy about this and felt like a hamster in the paws of a bear. He asked to stop it and concentrate. Suddenly, a red column of energy flew into the air. Sena was delighted that she had succeeded. Arel was a little surprised that only his palms helped her do it. He even fell to the floor in confusion. Arela's Training Camp Lesson 3 Arel sat on the ground with his arms crossed and expressed his dissatisfaction with Asya, who was in a hurry. He reminded her that in the last fight she was able to keep her distance by kicking, but the prince did not think that was the right approach. He said that one should not act in a hurry in a fight, but should analyze everything first. Asya bowed her head, exhaled heavily, and humbly apologized. She also asked if carrying the prince on her shoulders was really part of the training. Arel said that of course it was. She carried him, but her body was trembling from the strain. Arel said he would continue to explain to her while sitting on her shoulders. Arel shouted to Asya to keep walking and stay calm, because nothing was in her way. Asya, dripping in her tense sweat, agreed and continued walking toward the kingdom. The evening came. A crow cawed near the palace. A letter was brought to the empress. She sat at her desk and read it. It was again about Prince Arel. She leaned her head on her hand and reflected that he was only a concubine's child, and she did not pay much attention to him, and there was no need to. She held the letter up to the candles, and it caught fire. The empress said that it was time to get rid of the prince. Her eyes were filled with anger and hatred, and the piece of paper smoldered on the table. In the middle of the night, Asya stood in the forest, shaking. In front of her was the tree she had split into two. She really became stronger under the prince's guidance. The knight was not expecting anything more than physical activity, but then she realized. She was the child of a bankrupt aristocratic family. Asya wondered if she was worthy of such attention from the imperial family. The Pernils had never been particularly rich. They lived in a small estate, in cramped conditions, but not in poverty. Until monsters came to their house. They rushed into the burning house. The father then stayed behind to distract them, and told the family to run. Little Asya was asked to take care of the younger ones. She reached out to her father in tears, but was dragged to the exit. Then their family lost everything, and the nobles instantly turned away from them. As a result, Asya decided to join the ranks of the knights. Thanks to her talent in martial arts, she learned everything quickly, and she mastered the aura of the sword. She was assigned to the 15th Company of the Imperial Army. Asya stood at the exit of a bar where everyone was having fun, playing cards and drinking beer. This company had the lowest rating of all. A man approached her. He was the worst thing she had to deal with at work. He was a disgusting commander with a very weak aura for his age. He reached out to Asya with his hand, saying that he had already prepared some special training for her. He took her by the shoulder and compared her to his daughter. This commander was intrusive and unpleasant to Asya. He invited her to go to dinner together. She imagined him in the place of the tree she had cut in two. This is what she would really like to do with him. In desperation, she applied for the position of a privateer. She never thought she would be accepted. With this, her life began to improve. She needed to save some more money so that her younger brother could enter the academy. Looking up at the sky with her spear in hand, she saw a beautiful sunset. Asya was grateful to the emperor and wanted to repay him in some way for changing her life for the better. And what about Sena? She stretched on the street next to the building and told the guy that she had applied. He said that with her endless energy, it was the right place to go. She then wished him a good day with a smile. In Sena Gallo's family, there were only mercenaries who had made a career out of it for many years. She grew up among them, constantly moving, because they led a nomadic lifestyle. The mercenaries treated her well, and there was an atmosphere of kindness. Little Sena was sitting with a man at the table who said 
that there had been no war for thirty years, and despite the fact that everything was calm overhead, they still made money from the war. He warned Sena that she needed to find something else just in case. The old men wished her a future as a mercenary, but he wanted Sena to go her own way, because she was still young. She happily and smilingly agreed with her father and promised to find her calling. Then she took her things, got on her cart, and left home. Nightly training was easy enough for her. The only difficult thing was her father's death while she was away. He did not share something with a corrupt lord and was horribly killed. He was tortured. Sena realized that her father had done a bad thing. But she also realized that she shouldn't have said that because she had taken after him. She had no control over herself when it came to her interests. She came and cut down the scoundrels who crossed her path. Sena took revenge without question on those who only wanted to line their pockets. She furiously beat and shouted at him that he should not have made the nomads look like criminals and ordered him to eliminate them. He begged for mercy, but got what he deserved. Sena did not regret this act, but was only proud of herself whistling a song in a quiet forest. Since then, Sena has been sent away for various reasons. It got to the point where she was specifically assigned the most difficult missions. This is what made her try her hand at private service. Everyone enjoyed her company. Arel, sitting in his office, told the girls that they should all work out together. The girls thought they were lucky enough to have everything going for them. Arel seemed to them to be lazy but also quite smart. He was very cute, sitting with his toys or eating cookies. Sena was fascinated by the prince. She stood in the middle of the garden and decided that it was her duty to thank the emperor for this opportunity. She radiated her energy. Asya and Sena stood there smiling. They wanted to protect the prince for the rest of their lives. They were approaching the royal gate with a guard. Arel was sitting at a table writing something down with a pen. Although he is not very good at fighting, he is still brilliant in his own way. He managed to create something new and thus support the economy of the empire. He helped Princess Kania to reveal her aura in a very short time thanks to his theory. He is very wise and educated. The prince was resting on a deck chair under an umbrella. He was drinking a cold drink from a straw and enjoying a pleasant lazy rest. Arela Arnesia was already thirteen years old. He did nothing but do nothing. The emperor was informed in his office that the third prince would turn fourteen next year. He would be attending a coming-of-age ceremony. One of the people sitting at the table, Count Tempest, proclaimed that since he had proved himself well, it would not be out of place to give him proper authority during the ceremony. This made the emperor think. He agreed that he was old enough to prove himself in the government. The emperor asked if he should give Arella land. Everyone at the table confirmed this. The emperor instantly slammed his fist on the table and called everyone present. He realized that they wanted to resettle Prince Arel far away. The count again suggested that perhaps the emperor was planning to make the prince his heir. The emperor's veins began to bulge with anger. He barked at them with all his severity. These words were nonsense to him. The emperor's fist had almost pierced the table. He repeated with fury that the first prince would be the heir to the throne, and that Arel was not interested in ruling. The duke stood up in front of the furious emperor. He said that the prince's achievements were known throughout the continent, and that the aristocrats had already formed a faction supporting the third prince. With confidence in his eyes, Duke Gus said, that everything was not going in favor of the first descendant, and public opinion was quite changeable. The words that many people want to see him on the throne, even if they don't say so directly, made the emperor think. He stopped this talk and sat back down in his seat. The emperor was presented with a large number of leaves and scrolls on a tray. Many aristocrats were concerned about the situation and wanted stability in the empire. The emperor looked through these letters all of which had the same request written on them. They all wanted to get rid of Arella and send him away from the capital. These bloodthirsty demons continued to pester the emperor and persuade him, for this was the opinion of the majority of the nobility. 
the emperor exhaled a heavy breath. He accepted their words and said that if he could find a suitable territory, he would send him there. The prince sat behind his chair and read the letter. He wondered what could have happened at that meeting. He threw the letter on the table where the emperor was giving away his land. Aurel realized that he was being expelled. He touched his forehead with his hand and began to rejoice. He jumped up from under the table and started laughing and rejoicing that he would have his own land. He was glad and happy with this news. The prince did not need a throne, not with so many hyenas around. His own territory with a steady income was what Aurel needed. Shouts of joy could be heard from the palace. It was a dream come true to have a personal home on his own land. The prince managed to achieve his dream. The Hala, the land of the north. It snows here all year round. It is very easy to freeze to death in such a place. It's not even possible to farm there. Aurel read the book with disappointment. He quickly closed it and explained that in a month after the coming of age ceremony, he would be moving. He had only a year left, and everything had to be ready by then. Aurel warned everyone who was with him to prepare for difficulties, because they would be on their own. The prince said that if someone didn't want to move, he would help them find a new job. But everyone agreed to stay with him with a smile on their face. Luckily for Aurel, most would follow him, including the entire team of alchemists. Sena was clearly not happy enough that the prince was given land in Fahala. The prince inquired about the reason for her dissatisfaction. One day Sena went to Fahala. She lived there for a whole year on duty. Aurel was surprised that she had really been to every corner of the world. Sena said that it was not very dangerous there, just incredibly cold. Her tears and snot froze instantly. Coughing, Sena said that even monsters don't go there, but in general, it's, well, okay. From Sena's stories, Aurel understood that it was really terrible and cold. That's why the nobleman wanted to put him there. The prince leaned back in his chair. Sena began to calm him down and tell him that it wasn't that bad. But Aurel really thought he would be sent to a much worse place. For example, to the desert, where he would have to run away from scary monsters with disgusting tentacles. Or to some volcano with a fire-breathing dragon living in its mouth. So in principle, Aurel felt at ease with this choice. If they were going to get rid of him, then playing it safe was the best way to go. Sena and Asia stood over the prince with eyes full of tears. They promised to protect him no matter what. Aurel was angry because they had misunderstood him. Asia and Sena were standing at the entrance. Asia asked her to tell the truth, but Sena did not understand what she meant. It was about the story, and she thought Aurel understood as well. Sena continued to bend her line and say that it was just cold out there, and she added that it was a wilderness. Sena said that the reason the knights were sent there was to kill all the monsters that had come there. Asia fell silent. Sena laughed. Asia asked her not to joke anymore and turned away from Sena, who asked if she wanted to stay. Asia replied that she would follow Aurel wherever he went, but she didn't think he would be taken away so quickly. Sena thought about it. She thought there was no reason to worry. Asia asked why Sena thought so. She could see Aurel's eyes, which were obviously thinking about something. He didn't look desperate or disappointed as he sorted through the papers. That was why Sena was sure that everything would be fine. Asia accepted this answer. They thought they should send letters to their families, just in case. Aurel finished with his documents and drawings. He held his head, exhaled heavily, and thought of his mother. He was sure she was very upset, though she hadn't said anything to Aurel. The prince paced from side to side in confusion, wondering about the safety of Lady Lafania and Princess Cania. He put his finger to his chin and began to think. The first thing that came to mind was to create a communication sphere or an emergency teleporter. He leaned against the table and realized that he had to think it through. Aurel quickly pulled himself together and realized that this harsh land was the perfect place for a professional like him. Preparing for Exile, Step 1 In front of Aurel stood the mages 
who were ready to help the prince. He was surprised that the mage Payan came not alone, but with his students. Aurel crossed his palms, and with a sly smile asked him to keep everything a secret. Payan adjusted his glasses and, of course, agreed. Aurel slipped the magician a sheet of drawings on the table. He wanted Payan to do something as soon as possible. The magician took the piece of paper and began to look at it closely. Sweat broke out on his face at what he saw. Pian shockedly asked the prince whether he had developed it himself or with someone else's help. The prince sat there calmly and contentedly and said that it was his idea, an updated version of the sage's necklace, a similar artifact that he gave to Cania. According to these schemes, the effect was twice as high as the original, and the production cost one-tenth of the cost. Pian clutched the letter in shock. He did not understand how the young prince could have come up with such a brilliant idea. Arella wondered if he could reproduce it, or if it was too complicated for Payan. The magician replied that the drawing was perfect and that it would be easy to make. But the magician had his doubts because he knew the author of the original artifact. The prince realized that he was afraid to create something better than the original. Arella opened the locker. He took out a bag and put it on the table. It was a payment for Payan's silence. The mage thought about it. Arel put in another bag of coins for materials and labor costs, and one more for tricks, and a front payment for participation in future projects. Payne's jaw dropped from the number of bags of jewelry. He gladly agreed. All the magicians immediately knelt down before the prince. As expected, money is the best way to solve problems. Aurel gladly told the magicians that he would wait for the results of the work and ask them to do it within a month. Payan agreed. The prince was unabashedly happy to have conquered him, and now he had the magician on a short leash. Time passed. The tired magicians came to the prince. Payan was holding a pillow with a necklace in his hands. They called it the Necklace of the Silver-Haired Sage. Aurel asked in horror not to call it that. The prince took the necklace and looked at it closely. He marveled that they had created it in ten days. But now, he realized the true potential of these people. Aurel liked the quality, he appreciated Payan's work. He said that now they had to start mass production. Payan asked how much was needed. Aurel put up a boat with five fingers. The magician behind him was surprised at the number but the prince was happy to say that fifty would be enough for the first time. The magicians were shocked, but Pian agreed. They left the office in despair, and the prince saw them off with a joyful face with motivational phrases. Preparing for Exile, Step 2 At night, a carriage arrived. Arel, who was eating cookies, and Asia were sitting there. She asked where they were going and why, because they could do something for Arel without his presence. Arel scratched the back of his head. He said that it was something he had to choose personally, so his presence was required. Asya asked why they were going at such a late hour. The prince was reluctant to speak at first, but finally decided. They were going to the slave market. Asya was quiet for a moment to think. She shouted at the prince in shock. Asya shouted that the prince was already obsessed with power. The prince did not understand what she meant. The carriage bounced along the road from the pun. Snow and cold. Arel, whip in hand, was beating the slave and shouting at him to speed up. Like the last bastard, he manipulated and blackmailed the slaves with food until they filled a thousand boxes. That's what Asya thought. The prince waved his hands in front of Asya, who had made up a nonsense for herself, shouting. He was surprised that people thought that about him. Asya apologized to the prince. The carriage continued to drive through the dark forest. What else could they think of when it came to buying slaves? Hell, full of screams and sobs. The shameless theft of children from their parents. But in reality, it was not like that. A clean room. Clean slaves who didn't look beaten or unhappy. Arel was surprised by the reality. Asya had told the prince that if the slaves got sick, it would be a big problem, so the overseers were watching out for that. The man with the clean boots confirmed Asya's words and said 
that this was a place of carefully selected and healthy labor. He enthusiastically said that their slave market was truly majestic and multifaceted. He put his hand to his chest and bent down in front of the prince. The man introduced himself as the head of the place named Yang. The prince asked him to stop using his full title because he had come as a customer. Jan was aware of the prince's arrival, so he was going to be especially polite to Aurel. Jan asked the prince to follow him. The three of them walked down the hall. Jan walked in front and waved his arms, saying that their organization followed all the laws. They sold and bought only labor. Asia quietly added that the people who worked there were mostly those who could not pay their taxes and were drowning in debt. It was a revelation for Arella. It was sometimes the only option not to starve to death, Asia added regretfully. Jan opened the door and heard their conversation and confirmed Asia's words. Of course, they had other criminals, but he wasn't going to offer them. Arel realized that Jan had prepared for his visit, so he couldn't find anything to complain about. Jan sat down on a chair in his office and asked what kind of slaves the prince wanted. He leaned his elbows on the table and waited for an answer. Arel replied thoughtfully that he wanted different and bigger ones. Jan happily agreed and specified the number. Arel said he needed 150. This shocked January. Arel asked if that was too much for them. Ian started to look through the papers and said that it was not much, but they would need to use the resources of the branches outside the capital. Jan said he could find everyone without any problems, but he decided to clarify the reasons for this need. Arel waved his hand and asked him not to worry, because he was not up to anything strange. The prince clarified that he had only one request. He wanted the slaves to be divided into groups of four or five based on their family or close ties. Jan did not object, because it was not uncommon for an entire family to be sold into slavery. He gestured to someone with his finger. Three guys came up to him with a pile of paper. They put it on the table for Jan, who asked everyone to read the candidates. Arel looked around and noticed that the sorting was not bad, because there was even a division by reading skills. The prince asked Jan to send them to the right places for him. The man gladly agreed. It was time to make a contract. Arel asked Asia to bring bags of gold. They put them on the table, and Jan's eyes shone. He added with crazy eyes that from now on Arel was a privileged client for them. Once again, Arel was convinced that money solves everything. Asia was silent next to him. The carriage was on its way back through the morning woods. Asia asked again why the prince needed so many slaves. Arel turned to her. He said with a smile that he wanted to replenish the human resource in his new lands, and the more the better. Almost no one lived on that land, so he did not see the point of being the ruler of a land with no people. Arel twirled the necklace around his finger and said that the slaves would pave the way. He wanted to give artifacts to every family and teach them what they needed. Then they would become productive and pay off quickly. Asia looked at the prince with a surprised face. Arel didn't seem to like it. Arel leaned down on the seat of the carriage and said that he wasn't going to quietly and peacefully curl up there from the cold. He wanted to find a way to maximize the territory that belonged to him. And with a sly smile, he added that it was all for his personal comfort. Asia expressed her delight. He could already imagine himself on the sofa with a crown on his head and a glass in his hand. He had to recruit and train people in advance so that there would be someone to fulfill his orders at the Fakilla. He just had to wait and everyone would see for themselves. It was a sunny day. Arel was resting on his bed and lost in thought. When a chick flies out of its nest, the most difficult part is saying goodbye to its home and family. There was a mess around Arel's bed. Suddenly, someone knocked on his door. He got out of bed. It was Mrs. Lafania, with tears streaming down her face. She ran to him and grabbed him in a tight hug. Her mother asked if she needed to speak to the emperor. He assured her that everything was fine and there was no reason to worry. He promised to write to her often. 
Moreover, there was still a whole year ahead, so there was no reason to cry. She left the room, supported by a maid, and Arel waved after her. The prince decided to keep the place where he was being sent a secret, and he would tell his mother when everything was in place. He looked out the window, and thought that this way his mother would worry less about his independent life. Suddenly, there was a noise outside. The knight was startled by the blast wave. Three guys were shaking under the wall in fear. Someone's indignant voice shouted at them. It was a furious Kanaya. She stood in the middle of the dilapidated building and shouted at the top of her lungs that she refused to accept this. She turned around furiously looking for the next victim. She called the next one with her finger. She ordered them to beat with all their might. Otherwise, they will be seriously harmed. Her pupils shrank significantly with anger. The boys continued to shake and cry in fear. Kanya waved her sword and thought that it was the noble's fault that Arel had to leave the capital. She could understand the situation from Arel's side, but she could not accept it. And the most painful thing for her was that he had found out about it six months ago and only told her now. She waved her sword in anger. The guy flew back against the wall, almost smashing it. Kanya exhaled a sigh of regret. Was it really because he had decided that nothing could be changed? In fact, Arel didn't want to speak because he knew she would get angry. She was clutching her sword. She bowed her head to the floor. Her aura began to release. She could not just let her brother go. The boys were afraid of her aura. When her emotions went off the charts, Mana whirled inside her body and was released. This pillar of energy flew around Kanya. Everything happened as Arel had planned. She turned around with incredible energy and summoned the next one. On that very day, the youngest swordsman, the third most powerful in the history of the Empire, was born. Kanya rejected the next knight and sent him into the sky. The reason for this was her obsession with her younger brother, but of course no one will know about it. It is a sunny day. Trees behind a barbed wire fence. He suddenly remembered his first life through a familiar feeling. Before he went to the service, time flew by quite quickly. But after the call-up, it seemed to slow down. Then he stood in front of the entrance, and was not very happy with this life. And now it's happening again. Arella Arnesia was already fourteen years old. He was sitting behind his throne. The banquet for his coming of age was in full swing. Everyone came up to him with congratulations. Arel thought these speeches were boring. But of course, he responded with all respect. But he wanted this Mr. Perel to disappear from his eyes. Compared to his first birthday, there were much more people here. Back then he could at least pretend to fall asleep, but now he had to put on a smile and wave like a fool. The congratulations continued. Arel was sure that behind their smiles and joyful greetings were evil creatures who were eager for this day to see the prince finally disappear from the palace. Arel was annoyed by this hypocrisy. He was already thinking of doing something. His mother passed by and greeted him. He rejected the idea of doing something while his mother was watching. He had to behave properly. In a month, he would not see those insolent faces. So in honor of this farewell, he decided to show mercy. The empress came to him with congratulations. She looked at the prince with a sly look. She told him that he was an adult, even received his lands from the emperor. Only now, probably, Lafana is upset. Arel smiled into her face. There was no way this white-haired mimic could miss the royal celebration. The prince stood up and bowed to the empress. He told her that he was not upset about his mother. It would be time to leave her anyway. The empress was clearly not happy at these words. She hid her ugly face and said that Zale would miss him, because thanks to Arel his skills with weapons had improved significantly. She thanked Arel for his help and beckoned to a maid who was carrying something. The prince was surprised, but he was sure that this gift would be quite suspicious. It was a coat with fox fur, Fahala's most famous product. Two maids put the coat on Arella. The prince realized that she was the one behind it all. The empress was covering her cunning face with a fan. He had no doubt about it. 
Zale was not the type to accept help from the outside, let alone thank it. Zale turned in their direction. He had gotten what he wanted with the power he had and the support he needed. It was obvious whose hand this was. She had mocked Arell by giving him such a gift. He held back his anger, his fist tensed, his veins bulging. But if he had been outraged, he would have made things worse. Prince Arell made a grateful face and put on a smile in front of the Empress. He said that even if they were far from each other, they would still help and support each other. The Empress smiled and was happy to see him in return. But inside, they had hatred and rivalry. Arel hoped that the day would come when they would say to each other what they had never thought of saying. It was night in the kingdom. Arel stood on the terrace and rejoiced at the end of the boring banquet. He had a feeling that he had forgotten something, but he couldn't figure out what it was. He turned around and saw Kania standing behind him. She had never been so quiet. It seemed that she was still resentful of Arel's failure to tell her about the move. He decided to apologize to her. But in an instant, Kanaya changed. Her expression was furious. Arel realized that she was definitely up to something. She ran off somewhere, and Arel suspected that she wanted to make a statement. And that would definitely get the prince into trouble. Kanya ran up angrily and addressed the emperor, who was calmly drinking wine. He asked her to postpone the conversation until later. But the princess was determined to bend her line. Everyone around them turned to them. Kanya told her father that she was going to follow Arel. Everyone around them dropped their glasses in shock. The prince stood there and reacted in shock to this statement. He turned to Kanya's mother to calm her daughter down. But she stood there like a stone. Veins appeared on the emperor's forehead. He stood up angrily and was clearly against the idea. Arel stood aside and watched. He realized that Kanya was the most stubborn of the three children. But Arel also wondered why Kanya would follow him. The princess looked boldly into the emperor's eyes. She declared that she was going to be Arel's personal knight. The prince hid himself in the head with his fist in shock. The emperor waved his hands and shouted at her that she did not know what she was talking about and that it did not matter how well she was skilled with a sword. Kanayu interrupted him and said, that this was the most important thing. She had recently reached the level of a master. All the guests around him turned pale. Arel was also shocked. The emperor could not believe it, because she was nineteen years old, and the only one who could achieve this was the late emperor. She snatched the sword from the hands of the knight next to her. Kania was going to prove it by asking everyone who cared about her life to stand back. She raised the sword in front of her. A strong energy flew around her, forming a strong wind. It made the guests cover themselves with their hands. She swung with fury, her power passed through the whole room, and the princess cut the birthday cake along with the table. Arel was shocked to realize what she was doing. Everyone around Kania stood with their jaws open. They exclaimed that she had really become a sword master. It was incredible. A joyful noise arose around the princess. Kania humbly turned to her father and told him that she had really thought and decided for a long time. She bowed before him, sword in hand, and said that she did not want to marry someone she did not even know. Rather, she would follow her younger brother to those unknown lands and help Arel on this difficult journey. She chose the path of a knight and a defender because she saw it as her mission. Arel looked at this and could hardly hold back his tears. Kanaya had just given up being a princess in front of everyone, and although it might seem like a joke, the consequences would be far from funny. Everyone around her was already discussing it. Kania still stood leaning toward the emperor, a smile on her face. Arel did not understand if she really wanted to do this. He scratched his head, wondering what his sister was doing. But he remembered that it was all because of him. He decided to stop her. The prince shouted to Kania. Meanwhile, she continued to persuade him, promising to prove her resolve. The princess turned to the prince. She raised her sword. She leaned toward it and knelt down in front of Arel. The sword that had been with her all her life, that would be her support in the future. 
Kanya dedicated the sword to Arel and took a knight's oath. She promised to always be on his side, destroying any obstacles in the prince's path. Arel stood there in a daze. Kanya took his hand in hers and said that from that moment on, she, Kanya Arnesia, would be his faithful knight until death do them part. Arel could not believe what was happening. It was a knightly oath. He remembered that it didn't count, because officially, she wasn't allowed to. After all, his sister had not yet received a knighthood. Moreover, she hadn't coordinated it with anyone. Kanya let go of the prince's hand. Arel realized that this was not the problem. A lot of people were standing around and saw it. The knight's oath is no joke, especially when it is given by a sword master. Anyone there was taking it seriously. Arel held his head. It was on purpose. From the outside, it was just taking care of her younger brother, but in reality, she was making a better future for herself. There was no face on the emperor. A maid was picking up Kania's mother from the floor. The empress was trembling as she looked at Arella and Kania. She was incredibly angry. She thought that she was about to get rid of the problem, and suddenly another one appeared. Arel stood there smiling, tears streaming down his cheeks. It was the first time Arel had ever thought about it, but it seemed that all his birthdays just had to end in a shitty way. The prince didn't want to celebrate them anymore. After that day, everything continued to go on as usual. Wooden boxes were loaded into the carriages. Arel grabbed his leather briefcase. He straightened his hat and exclaimed with joy that he was leaving. Mrs. Lafania and Cena stood there with languid eyes. His mother seemed to think that he was born only yesterday, and already he was a grown-up. Arel approached his mother. She took hold of his temple, and he touched her hand. The prince promised that he would visit his mother. Arel was surprised to hear that he used to cry a lot as a child, because he didn't think he was that tearful. His mother used to tell him to go for medical help in case something happened. He obeyed with a smile. Arel dared to say where he would go, but Mrs. Lafania interrupted him. She knew. This alarmed Arel. He kept it a secret, but she found out anyway. He scratched the back of his head as his mother yelled at him, that how could a mother not know something about her child? She took him into a tight hug. She knew that no matter where her child was sent, he was a smart boy. Lafania hugged her son with all her love and asked him to be careful. Arel's eyes were wet. He leaned on her shoulder and also asked her to be careful. Parting with family is always sad. Even though he can come back at any time, it is still hard on the soul. The carts flew along the snowy roads, the northernmost part of the empire, the frozen ground at the foot of the icy mountains. Arel's face was nearly torn apart by a gust of wind as he leaned out the window. He was going to conquer lands that no one had the courage to set foot on. He asked a worker to dig a hole, but the pick was bent by the hard ground. Those who sent Arel there definitely wanted him dead. He shouted through the window, that he would find a way to survive even in the volcano's mouth. Kania asked him to stop. He turned his head into the carriage. His face was covered in snow, and his cheeks were red from the cold. The magical items for heating worked perfectly, and kept Arel warm, who was already sitting in a fur coat. But Kania didn't understand why she had to spend so much money on warming artifacts, and the carriage was warm enough as it was. Kania was wearing a dress. It didn't seem logical to be dressed like that in such a cold weather. He focused his attention on Kanya. The prince noticed that she was using a cocoon of mana to trap heat. Arel hadn't taught her to do that, but it must have been a self-preservation instinct. Pritzen said that her powers were indeed frightening. Kanya asked if it was true that not everyone could do this. Frozen, Asia and Sena, who were driving the carts across the snowy field, said that it was better not to ask people that, or they might hit them. Arel asked Kania if she would regret her choice. Kania asked him irritably if he was tired of her company. Arel turned away in confusion. The princess pulled his cheek. Arel explained that he meant something else and added that he was in pain. Kania decided to go with Arel to the north as his personal knight. 
he spent the whole day persuading the emperor. But Kania did not listen to her father or mother. She did not want to stay and followed the prince. Kania continued to pull his cheek thoughtfully. She did not regret her choice. She let go of Arel, who was sitting with his face contorted in pain. Kania thought it was a great opportunity. Arel did not understand what kind of opportunity she was talking about. The princess remembered that she had not told Arel. She bowed her head in sadness and said that if she had stayed, she would have been married off this year. Arel understood, because she was already nineteen years old, and it was strange that she hadn't been married off earlier. Kanayu sat back and said she was lucky to have escaped. It is clear why she decided to run away with Arel. Kanya, like the prince, did not like restrictions, so he could understand her feelings. She looked out the carriage window with a happy look. From that day on, she would be free. Arel asked what kind of husband she had chosen. But Kanaya did not know, because she refused to say. They were lucky that the wedding did not happen, because Kanya would have made a married life for them. They continued to drive through the snowy forests. They arrived and stepped onto the snowy road. The gate opened in front of them. Arel Asia and Sena walked confidently toward the entrance. A thousand soldiers and two hundred slaves would become the new inhabitants of this place, and all his maids, alchemists, and the rest. Arel was looking forward to creating a personal paradise. First, he had to establish the defense of Phahalia. This task fell to Asia and Sena. They led the soldiers, signed various treaties. And as for Kanya, as much as Arella felt sorry for her, he didn't want to give her this job. She would tear apart the knight's barracks in no time. But she herself was not very interested in working with the army. Kanya ran like a child in the snow. Arel sat down from his throne and returned to work. The total population of Fahilia was about 10,000 people, scattered in 12 small villages. Arel thought that it would be good to make a road to them. Most of them were hunters and gatherers who had lived there since the beginning of time. And for a hundred years, no one had left or entered, so the population continued to decline. Arel reread the book and realized that the area was not just poor, but also on the way to oblivion. The palace didn't even collect taxes from them. They simply blacklisted the place and ignored it. Arel wondered if there had ever been a landlord there. He picked up an account book. He put his feet up on the table and began to read. There had been a landlord, but he hadn't succeeded with the land. He had borrowed a very large sum of money because of the shortage of money. Arel imagined him as a fool with his eyes glued shut. He threw that book away, thinking it couldn't get any worse, but at least that lord was of some use. He became an example of what it is better not to be. Arel unfolded the map on the table muttering under his breath. He hoped that he would have something to see on it. The prince saw that there were few people, but a lot of wood. The first thing that came to his mind, of course, was paper production. This is a very valuable resource in the world, and it was worth a try. Arel's previous products were still selling steadily, so he didn't have to worry. He turned away from the map and decided it was time to meet the locals. If the former lord was a fool, then who was in charge of this territory? Arel had an idea. He suddenly wanted to meet all the village elders in person. The doors to the palace opened. A dozen people came in. Arel looked at them closely. As expected from the inhabitants of the Ice Valley, they were all fit and strong. Such people could tear wolves apart with their hands. The elders greeted their new lord. They all bowed before him. He asked them to memorize his name. Arel or Nisha. He promised that he would be a lord they could count on. In their eyes, he looked more like a child, and they hardly trusted him. Arel said seriously that he would not allow them to look down on him. The lord noticed a young man who was among the elders, and Arel suspected that he was superfluous. The young man fell to the ground and said with regret that his father, who was the headman, had died a year ago, and now he had taken his place. Arel knew this because he had read all the reports last night. Arel just wanted to show the residents that he was in charge. 
behind a rail walked maids carrying food and drinks. The Lord said that the elders had a long conversation to have, so he suggested that they continue at the table. The elders looked at Arel with surprise. He realized that the most hated thing for such people was to eat with the leaders. Arel imagined himself as a boss who offered his subordinates all the food with an inhuman smile. But in reality, Arel wasn't really hungry himself. Everyone sat down quietly at the table, each with a plate of croquettes in front of them. But the elders' faces looked like they were being tortured. Arel asked if they were not happy to be there but they simultaneously exclaimed the opposite. The prince, to tell the truth, did not like the atmosphere either. Kanya was laughing at Arel's seriousness. The elders began to open the cloche. They were delighted. Beer and meat fresh from the oven. Arel added that he wanted to treat them to something better, but this was all he had. Arel sipped his beer quietly, and they again said in unison that they were very grateful for it. He noticed that they agreed with everything he said. But it was really a simple meal, and they didn't have enough money for more. One of the people present was surprised by the salt in the meat. Salt was valuable here, and salted meat was a delicacy. The Lord ate with everyone to show his closeness to the people. He wanted to be a wise Lord for the people. Arel began to speak for the former Lord, namely, for the trouble he had caused them. He assured them, that things would be different from now on. The treats continued. Arel believed that continuing the business they had been doing for ten years was a road to nowhere. Of course, hunting was able to feed them. But it couldn't go on forever. So Arel decided that from that moment on, he would give some instructions that would seem incomprehensible. The only thing he can do in this situation is to ask for something. He wiped a napkin around his mouth. He put it on the table and stood up abruptly, asking everyone to trust him. Everyone was delighted with Arel. They thought he was cool. They saw him as an angel who had fallen from heaven. Arel quickly grounded them, and asked them not to make him an idol. He just wanted them to follow his instructions. And if they did, he would let them forget about the hunt. The first thing Arel asked was to welcome the people with whom the prince had come. The slaves had to be settled and equipped. They were all freed and could live with their families. Those who were good at something would work for the prince. The headman said they would accept without question, but they were not sure about the other residents. Arel clarified that he did not want any physical altercations, and he was asking for a reason. With a bribing look in his eyes, Arel hoped that he could come to an agreement with them. The elders coughed and agreed without question. Arel was overjoyed. The elders came out of the gate. The young man asked if the former lords were the same. He was told that compared to the others, Arel was a bit strange. Most of the lords did not show interest in the territory, as these lands were like a place of exile for them. The former lord had tried to do something, but due to his ignorance, he had done a lot of things that hurt most of the inhabitants. And now they had a new lord a young man who had just recently had his coming-of-age ceremony. He kept talking. At first, he thought it couldn't get any worse. He hoped he wouldn't do anything stupid like the old lord. But when he looked into the lord's eyes, he realized. Arel was not like the others. The young man asked if they had any hope. He replied that he did not know. For now, they could only trust. Arel was lying on Sada's lap, looking at the documents. Sena asked him why he was looking at the documents that the servants had already sorted out. He needed to check something. When he first took possession of the land, the population was about 10,000 people, but after checking, it turned out to be 9,651. Sena played with the prince's cheek while he continued to lie on her lap like a baby. He continued to say that including the peasants in that number, there were about 9,800 people. The population decline was a rather natural phenomenon. Arela took Sane by the wrist. While the Lord had been changing, the population had been decreasing at a rapid pace. But now, he didn't understand where everyone had gone. The number of newborns was also quite small, and all this was due to the poverty of the land. Even taking into account Arel's wealth, 
which reached 400 and 500,000 gold pieces that he had brought with him and his expenses for settling in. The money would last for about 50 years. Arel continued to lie with his back to Sena, who was pulling him by the arms. Those aristocratic bastards had thrown Arel in there on purpose to drown him, like in the mud, in a huge amount of problems. He was sure they were waiting for his quick death. Sena and Arel started talking about a former lord who had gone bankrupt trying to set up an agricultural business. Arel thought he was basically stupid. Only gathering and hunting were possible on those lands. Arel wondered if this was really the only way to make money. Suddenly, the prince had an idea. He jumped up and raised his finger to the sky. It was time to use the freaky hands plan. Sena smiled and clapped her hands. The first reform for a dying territory. Of course, it was the roads. Arel and Asia stood on the street and looked at the snow-covered road. There were potholes everywhere, which often caused accidents. There were no warning signs or fences anywhere. In short, no one took care of the roads. If a carriage fell off a cliff, no one would look for it. The elders were looking at the plan for building roads in Fahalia. They discussed that the Lord was hiring workers and promised to pay generously. The elders thought about it and decided to give it a try. They came to a snowy place. The elders were surprised. In front of them were carts with paving stones that were already being carried by workers. One man noticed, looking at the plan, that the project was quite large. Arel assured him that everything was under control and he would pay everyone properly. The elders thanked him with a smile and humility. Once again, Arel felt the power of money. The workers carried the sacks. Arel liked to watch others work. He stood and watched alongside Asa and Sena. This was the truth of life. If you want to eat, you have to work. Meanwhile, the road was already done. Arel happily checked the result of the work. He praised the workers and told them to keep working. Now it would be easier to get to them. The second reform for a dying territory. The shopkeeper in the store was dubious about the trading company in Fahala. But Arel, with angelic eyes, took him by the skin of his teeth in one hand and a bag of coins in the other, and the merchant immediately agreed. The prince planned to establish a trade in basic necessities for the locals. If he gave them orders from the trading company he ran, it would attract not only locals, but also wandering vendors with exclusive goods. Trade is a big step forward. The latest reform for a pacified territory. Arel pushed a pile of paper on the table toward Damon. He wondered if it was possible. Damon picked up the papers, read them, and asked with surprise if Arel really wanted to make paper. Arel waved his head with confidence. Of course, there was paper there, but it was a poor quality, made by simply steaming press fibers. Because of its high price, only people of high status could buy it. Arel had only seen it in the Imperial Library. Most people used parchment, and then only as a last resort. Damon said that paper was a really valuable thing. He believed that its production would be profitable. But the problem was that no one knew how to produce it, because they didn't have the technology. Arel stood up with a wild smile and leaned on the table. He said that if he didn't have the development, he wouldn't have offered it. Damon was surprised, but still expected it from the prince. Damon was interested in competitors. Arel didn't think it was a problem, because they would be doing something completely new. And before Damon's objections, Arel decided to show him the special equipment. Arel pulled out a drawing from his locker. Damon looked at it in shock and said it was perfect. But Damon still had his doubts about whether they would be able to create the equipment on their own. After all, alchemy is one thing a chemical element or medicine, but making machines is quite another. The local blacksmiths would barely be able to forge something similar, but Arel was interested in his silence. Damon continued that if they were gnomes from the capital, everything would be more possible. Arel's face lit up. There were many of them in the empire. They made everything to order. They said they could make anything of any complexity. Arel ran to find bags of money to pay the dwarves. But Damon stopped him and explained that these were not the kind of people to pay off with money. Arel was shocked to learn that they did not like money. Because of their pride, 
They would rather take an order where they can show their skills. Arel kicked out the guy who brought him the bags of money. Damon added that they would easily refuse an order if they didn't like even the tone, regardless of the money offered or the personality of the customer. Arel was surprised that there were still those who were interested not just in money, but also in the experience gained during the work. Arel wondered if they would go hungry if such orders ran out. Damon said he would ask his known friends. Arel was glad to hear that. He was sure that they would be interested in the drawing. A few days passed. A gnome village. The forge. The work was in full swing, with smoke coming out of the chimneys, hammers pounding, and shouts. The old man in charge was shouting at the other blacksmiths not to be idle, because if they didn't finish by the next day, there would be more work. The boy came in and told the master that he had a letter. He was not happy, suspecting that it was another letter from the imperial scum. He turned to the boy with the metal heated in the tongs and told him to send them away, because he had everything scheduled until next year. His name was Blacksmith Aiken. The master angrily shouted at the boy again. But the boy was frightened and said that the letter came from the alchemist, who had come ten years ago. He handed the master the letter. He mentioned Darman. The master was surprised that he had come to Fahalla. He continued reading. The boy Ben stood behind him waiting. Master Aiken said that he was leaving Ben in charge for a while. The boy was shocked. The blacksmith walked sternly toward the door. Ben stood there stunned, wondering if there was something so important that the blacksmith changed his face so quickly. Ben wondered what it said. A lot of workers had gathered. They were blacksmiths who resented Aiken for taking them away from their work. They sat at a table, drank beer, and complained about the master. There were thirty-five blacksmiths there. A worker with an eye patch asked what was going on. Aiken began to explain the reason for the gathering. He was pulling out a drawing that had been thrown at him, and the customer was from Fahilia. He was the designer. The bald-bearded man was outraged that they were called for this. The foreman said with a serious face, that at first he also thought it was just another game, but he asked them to look at the drawing. Aiken placed it on the table in front of all the workers, who immediately began to look at it. Their eyes could not believe what they were seeing. They were surprised and shocked at the same time. Aiken confirmed that it was a drawing of a paper machine. He reminded the workers that five years ago, a guy from the East wanted to create something similar and approached them. The worker remembered and said with regret that, Unfortunately, they hadn't succeeded. Then the blacksmith was so humiliated that he almost gave up the business. The foreman raised the bundle to the top of the mountain and said joyfully that now the Fakilla had a machine design that they had failed to create five years ago, and they needed the help of blacksmiths to realize the project. The workers turned to him with anxious looks. Aiken exhaled and said that he could do it himself if they didn't want to. One worker confirmed his reluctance. Others said that the master had enough work to do without it. Aiken replied that his apprentices would handle the work themselves, and he would work on this project. The master asked who would follow him. The workers remained silent. And in a moment, there was a ruckus. They all expressed their desire to help. Aiken expected this, because even he was intrigued by the drawing. The workers began to quarrel with each other for a place on the project. The foreman shouted at the blacksmiths to calm down. Aiken explained that the forge would not survive without people, so he decided to take half of it. There was a lot of tension between the workers. The master regretfully said that they had to decide who would leave and who would stay. The workers wondered how this would be decided. Suddenly, a guy named Ben came into the room and wanted something from Aiken. He saw a fight between the workers, and they were throwing everything they could at each other. If you can't negotiate, you have to use your fists. Aiken also received a hard punch. The bearded ones twisted their beards and shaved their heads. It was a sacred rule of the dwarves in Aiken's forge. A bottle flew through the door, and Ben decided to come back later. Arel sat on the chair and thought about what to do while the blacksmiths would be thinking for five days. He jumped onto the bed and decided that he would, of course, rest. The prince spun around in his blanket and was glad to be able to lie there and do nothing. He decided to take a nap, but a loud sound disturbed his peace. 
Arel sat down on the bed, wrapped up in his blankets, and did not resent the fact that someone was shouting in his ear as if to spite him. Arel saw a funny griffin in the window. Arel didn't understand what was happening to Fry, because he could fly, but not with such speed and trajectory. And he was flying very high, because Arel's room was almost on the top floor of the palace. On the ground was Kanya, who caught the falling griffin in her arms. She was teaching poor Fry to fly. The princess wanted to help him, and threw him up again. She threw him so high that he could not see the griffin. Arel was getting dressed, and didn't understand why Kanya was doing this. Did he really tear her dress to make fun of the griffin like that? Kanya was distracted and answered that he hadn't done anything, and feathers flew behind her. The griffin fell to the ground. Arel said that Kanya was mocking him, but the princess denied it. She picked up the griffin and dusted it off, explaining that this was her way of teaching it. Arel was shocked by this training. A little bit of background. At the very beginning of the distribution of duties, Sister Kanya was left behind for a while. Her daily routine consisted of eating, exercising, and of course, sleeping. And on repeat. She couldn't sit still, so she had a lot of energy. She couldn't even eat a cookie in peace without thinking about anything. So when she saw a carefree griffin just playing with a butterfly, she decided to take it out on him. In short, she caught it red-handed. Kanya held the half-living Freya in her hands and told him that he was a future riding animal and that he needed to develop his speed. Arel didn't understand how tossing him would help her do that. Kanya asked him not to interfere if he did not understand what was going on. Arel was desperate. Surely, when muscles grow, the brain atrophies. Arel decided that he had to take matters into his own hands and walk Kanya, sacrificing his rest, of course. Arel thought about how to entertain his sister. In his previous life, he had relatives, of course, but those relationships were not very loving. The most successful relationships were those in which they never talked to death. Arel was certainly a pro, but something went wrong here. The prince took the frightened Freya from Kania's hands and let him go upstairs. Kania screamed at Arel, not understanding why he did it. The prince was just saving the poor griffin. Frey flew away. Kania was angry. It was time to learn how to be a good little brother, so Arel suggested that they play together. Arel held a pawn in his hand. They played chess and moved the pieces one by one. The knight beat the queen. Kania was trembling from the loss of the game. She flipped the board over in anger and shouted that she didn't want to play it anymore. Arel was beaten by the chessboard, not something he ever expected. Kania was convulsing and shouting that she didn't want to play it, and that Arel could have played along. The prince didn't really want to play chess himself, but there wasn't much to do in the north. He leaned over to Kanya and offered to try again. She was already in tears. Arel suggested using the artifact he had given her. It was supposed to help her think bigger. In reality, he couldn't help her, but he thought to really expose himself to her. They started a new game. Kanya had a knight in her hand, and Arella had a pawn. Kanya pushed, trying to activate the artifact, but in a moment it burst. Arel was shocked by this. Kanya was behaving quite strangely. She pulled out her sword with an angry face, and said she didn't want to play this bullshit. With one swing of her sword, Kanya turned one board into four. Arel calmly said that chess was the most appropriate way to train her mind. Kanya exclaimed that it seemed they would never play chess again. Of course, Arel agreed, because it would be difficult to play without a board. Arel turned away and continued to think of other ways to have fun with his sister. The prince asked directly what Kanaya usually does. She proudly replied that she trains, trains, and trains some more. Arel was going crazy. Didn't she really get tired of training all the time? Arel realized that with such a restless sister, he would not be able to rest. He wondered what he should do in this case. They both felt their stomachs growl. It dawned on Arel that it was almost lunchtime. He suggested that they try to cook something together. Kanya was frightened by the mere word. Arel assured her that it would be fun. Kanaya had never cooked in her life. She asked if it was necessary. Arel said that knights must know how to cook. 
Since ancient times, knights were not just guards, they went on expeditions to destroy monsters. They would shoot down whole bears with their bare hands. Such expeditions lasted more than a week. It's doubtful that Kanaya could have gone hungry all that time. Moreover, if you don't know anything about food and its processing, you can simply catch food poisoning and shake in front of the fire without vomiting. Arel pointed his finger at his sister and told her that she must learn to cook, because food is an important aspect of everyone's life. Kanaya sat down in the corner and sadly agreed. Arel happily told her not to worry, because he would help her. Of course, it was strange for Arel to teach his sister how to cook, because he was her younger brother, who should be teaching anyone else. Kanya and Arel stood in the kitchen. They put on their aprons. Kanya was ready to practice in the kitchen. Arel proudly said the name of today's dish, namely stew. Kanya was shocked. Meat is a simple dish made from a moderate amount of ingredients. It is the most common soldier's food during campaigns. It's easy to cook and most people like it, so it's the most ideal option. Suddenly, Kanaya and Arel found themselves dead on the floor due to food poisoning. But it was just his imagination, and he really hoped it wouldn't come to that. Kanaya was cutting carrots on the board while Arel watched her. Arel praised his sister for being so good with vegetables. It was easy enough for Kanaya. All the vegetables were just perfectly cut and arranged on plates. And now that Kanaya had cut all the ingredients, it was time to put them in the pot. She threw the carrots into the boiling water with a concentrated face. Arel told Kanya to add some spice. All that was left was to wait until the dish was no longer raw. They sat at the table. Kanya was catching barks, and the prince was spying on the dish. Voila, it was ready. There was a pretty and tasty-looking dish in the pot. It was Kanya's first meal. She tasted the food with delight. Arel said that it was not bad for a first-time cook. These words hurt Kanya. Arel said that if she continued to learn to cook, she would be able to go anywhere. Arel was already looking forward to his upcoming vacation, because the task of entertaining his sister was coming to an end. Suddenly, someone called Arel. A man flew into the dining room. He was almost out of breath. His suit was torn at the shoulder, and he brought some urgent news. Arel almost choked on his soup. The prince shouted that he had asked not to be disturbed today and hoped that it was something really serious, since they disobeyed his order. As it turned out, a delegation of dwarves had arrived. Arel was greatly surprised. They threatened the man with death if he did not bring the prince to them immediately. Arel was petrified, and the man begged him not to leave him. The prince did not understand why the dwarves had arrived so quickly. Of course, he was glad they agreed to help. He had to follow the plan, and it was better not to be lazy. But he definitely did not expect such a quick response. The workers and Aiken, who was holding their project in his hand, entered the room. Asia was next to the prince, who coughed and prepared to greet the dwarves. Aiken came very close to Arel and asked if he was the one who came up with the project. Asia was already twirling her spear and pulled Aiken away from the prince. She asked him to immediately apologize to Prince Arel for being rude. The master laughed and said that she had strong energy for a woman. Asia got even angrier. Arel wanted to stop her, because they were very important people. To understand, the concept of title and status was accepted only in human society, and dwarves did not care about those formalities. Aiken didn't dance in front of the emperor either. They spoke to everyone informally. Arel asked Asia not to tell them how to behave. After that, she obeyed and withdrew her spear. The prince decided to continue the conversation until Asia ate them. Arel confirmed that he was the author of the drawing. They immediately doubted his words and asked to see the real author. But Arel repeated even louder, with his hands to his chest, that he was indeed the author of that machine. The dwarves continued to mock the prince. Arel's patience was running out. Arel gave an order to Asa, who immediately flew over to the dwarves with a spear. Tonight's dinner is gnome sashimi. As a result, the butler had to intervene. The gnomes stood in front of Arel with their arms folded and asked him again about the blueprints. 
the prince was already being asked the same questions. He no longer understood what he had to do to make them believe him, because even the witnesses confirmed it. Around Arel stood a crowd of foul-smelling dwarves, whom he asked about the reason for his quick arrival, so they could rest and breathe fresh air. And Arel would breathe at the same time. Aiken leaned over to the table with a drawing and asked if the prince wanted their help. The prince confirmed this, explaining that there were no experienced craftsmen to do it. Aiken accepted his answer and added that human hands would not be enough to handle such details. It seemed to Aurel that he was bragging about being a dwarf. Aurel was lucky that he listened to Darman's advice. Aurel replied that at least the human brain was good enough for good ideas. You see, Aurel was a true genius. He put one foot up on the table and started to rant about how brilliant, smart, and smart and brilliant he was. Only after that did the dwarves begin to believe him and even thought that the prince was smarter than all the other dwarves present. Aiken believed that he was smart because of his strangeness and asked him to stop talking. Arel's plan of pranking the pranksters worked. He sat back in his chair and could finally get down to business. The gnomes interrupted the prince and said that they had already decided that they would take the job. This surprised Arel because they hadn't discussed any terms or payment. Aiken added that they didn't care because they would take on the work they liked. Aiken was serious. They did not mind looking at other developments of the genius. Arel was pleased. He said that it was really not just one drawing that he wanted to show. The dwarves liked that. The blacksmiths, with eyes full of passion, were ready to look at the other drawings of the genius. Their eyes embarrassed Arel. The prince reached into his locker. He took out another bundle. It gave the dwarves butterflies in their stomachs. Arel played with them like cats, waving the drawing in front of their faces. Aiken begged to see more, but the prince refused. The dwarves did not understand this answer. Aiken got angry and attacked the prince. He wanted to snatch the sheet of paper from Arel's hands. He wanted to see it fiercely, but the prince continued to play with them by the nose. Arel wagged his finger and motivated them by saying, that he would show them only after the dwarves had assembled the parts according to the drawing he had sent them. Aiken was almost impatient to see it. Arel said that the genius's trust had yet to be earned. The prince continued to make strange and cute faces. Aiken finally obeyed Arel. He turned to the exit and promised to create the thing as soon as possible, before he could blink. His eyes were literally burning with desire. Arel sat down with satisfaction and was glad that they liked his drawing so much. He wanted to show them the full plan of the car right away, but changed his mind. He was going to use it as a bait, and was sure that they would work twice as fast then. The prince considered himself a genius for coming up with such a bait for the gnomes. This was Arel's dark side. Everything went according to plan. In no time, the dwarves returned with the mechanism in their hands and huge bags under their eyes. Arel gladly handed over the next drawing. Then, in another moment, they finished the next drawing, and the workers were exhausted. Arel praised them, but was shocked at their speed and gave them the next drawing. The dwarf even flew into the bathroom to get the next drawing while the prince was washing. They got Arella at the most comfortable moments. The prince was still going through puberty. And the moment came when Aiken said that he had done what the prince had ordered. Arel and Daryl were shocked to see Aiken's scary face. They completed the design in less than ten days. Paper production line number one was successfully completed. Daryl presented Arel with the fruit of their labor. It was a beautiful clean and white sheet. It was like a treasure. Arel said that he was a real good man for coming up with this. Aiken was not happy with his words. Unlike conventional paper, which artisans dried by hand one sheet at a time, Arel created a machine that stamped it in bundles and in perfect white. It was fortunate that Vigalia was full of wood. He would turn the place into a papermaking factory with gusto. Aiken asked if Arel was satisfied. He was more than happy with the dwarves' work. But now, he needed a few more of these machines. Aiken went underground. It was only a matter of time before their paper hit the shelves around the world. All that remained was to establish trade relations and make money from it. 
a guy appeared in front of Arel and greeted the prince. But he was not sure whether he should call him Lord Fahala instead of prince. The boy was glad to see the prince, and Mrs. Lafania asked him to come. They were happy to see each other. Arel was looking for someone from the Einres family to entrust him with the job of selling paper. My uncle was the first to respond. Mrs. Lafania was happy to receive the letter. The people Arel could trust were relatives on his mother's side. This is the unity of the family. My uncle asked about the product in question. He picked up the cloth and showed him the paper. My uncle was surprised that it was paper. The uncle warned him that if Arel put the paper on the market, there would be a real scandal. Arel was shocked by this statement. The uncle went on to say that competitors would be furious if Arel sold a better product at more affordable prices. Recently, the demand for paper has been growing, so the price has also been rising, all because of the painstaking process of creation. It was sold out faster and faster, and the price kept rising. To buy a few leaves, you had to dump a huge sack of gold. His uncle used a personal example to tell him that he had recently paid a tidy sum for this luxury item. Arel listened attentively to his story. Arel assured his uncle not to worry, because if the quality of the product suffered even a little bit during creation, the buyer would have no reason to complain. This paper was a completely different and new product that was different. My uncle realized that making a better product without a markup sounded promising. Was there ever a better product than this one? My uncle took up a map of the world. He decided to create a sales plan right away. With this price, he was going to organize sales even in places where paper is only a dream. Arel was pleased with his uncle's enthusiasm. It was time to make money. His uncle automated the paper-making process. The gnomes built several such machines. Arel turned to the dwarves, who were about to leave for home. It had been less than a day since they had completed the design. Arel suggested that they at least celebrate and have a good meal. Aiken said that they had a lot of work to do, which of course the students were doing, but he thought it was better to come back and supervise. Aiken said to contact them if they had any more suggestions. They were ready to come back any time for a good job. Arel saw the dwarves off, he hoped they would at least celebrate. Without the blacksmiths, the prince would not have made it. Arel was grateful for their help and was ready to start selling the paper. It was a sunny day. It was definitely not Fahala. People were shocked by the new product on the shelves. Everyone felt the benefits and features of this product. The ink didn't smudge and the paper didn't tear from the pen. Everyone in the church was also excited about the new product. People all over the world were talking about the new product from Fahala. The rumors spread like wildfire. They called him a genius. They said that the young lord was trying his best to revive the frozen land. Everyone wanted to buy more of that paper. The emperor also got his hands on the new product. He noticed that the material for the documents had changed. The emperor asked the butler if he knew anything about this new kind of paper. He said that it was a novelty and the price was reasonable. Because of its good quality, the noble switched to this type of paper. The emperor wondered where it came from. He was told that it came from Fakilla. The emperor was shocked. He realized that it was the work of his son. The butler also added that Arel said that starting this year, Fakilla would start paying taxes again. The emperor was shocked to realize how much the income in Fakilia had increased. The emperor was surprised that Arel was able to revitalize the economy in such a short period of time. Despite the hard ground, she was unable to break the will of the emperor's son. Arel was reading a book and picking his nose. He had the feeling that someone had mentioned him, and he was sure that he was being praised. Arel lay on the bed and reached for a drink. He realized that he was really good because he had earned a lot of money from making paper so much that he could afford to drink as much sweet honey as he wanted. His sounds of pleasure could be heard from the kingdom. The first prince was drinking tea and said that today's tea smelled very good. It was different from what they usually drank. The empress was not happy and could not even eat the cake. The empress replied that it was a gift from the emperor's youngest son in exchange for a fur coat she had given him. The first prince said that as far as he knew, Fahilia was still dead. 
the empress agreed with her son and took a cup of tea with trembling hands. The son noticed that his mother looked pale and asked her if she was okay. The empress assured him that everything was fine. There was just a certain jewel that she did not like. She continued to drink her tea calmly. She said that she really wanted to destroy this jewel because it did not even shine. The empress was thinking about the bold rail. Her son asked if jewelry could be impudent. He suggested replacing it because they were full of them. The empress had already replaced it, but it still continued to bother her. Even in the reflection of the tea, she could see Arel, who continued to annoy her. She tried to calm him down and asked her puzzled son if he liked her gift of a sword. He enthusiastically replied that he liked it very much, because the dwarves had specially designed it. It fit perfectly in the boy's hand, and now it was easier for him to handle the sword. The empress thought only that it cost a lot. She got up from her chair. She went to her son and took him by the face. She told him that he was the only prince who would inherit the throne, and of course he needed this perfect sword. The empress continued to tell her son that he must live and think like an emperor always. The son expressed his understanding. The empress was sitting alone in the dining room when something got in her eye. She took a napkin from a cookie. She was muttering to herself about the paper developed at the fakilla. It irritated the empress that she kept hearing his name. She angrily threw everything off the table. She considered it an affront to her family. The queen's real name is Elia Pratz. The family of Duke Pratz was the only family of merchants who produced paper. Elia's veins were bulging with rage. The Pratz had only two competitors abroad. The first was the paper of the Maritime Empire. The second was from the East. After the war with the first, the paper produced there was banned from being imported. Pratz bought the other competitor and monopolized the industry. Elia screamed wildly that they had paid incredible money to give an exclusive product not for everyone, but Baby Arel decided to create something new. She couldn't stand him anymore. Her rage was incredible. She blamed all her troubles on Arel. The queen rushed out of the room. With all her strength, she opened the cabinet under the table. She took a paper and began to write with a pen. She wrapped the letter in an envelope. She could not delay any longer. It was full moon. Someone was getting out of the carriage. A silhouette in a robe could be seen in the doorway. Someone was smiling evilly back at her. Others were happy to see him. It was the prince who had come for new slaves. They started running after Arel again and asking him all the details. The Lord had a request strong boys who were resistant to the cold. He was looking for only such men, real working slaves. The boss, Yin, asked what the goal was. Arel needed a guard who could withstand the cold. While the roads were being repaired and paper was being produced, there was a shortage of guards. The purpose of the slaves is to protect the territory of Fahilia, Arel said proudly. The title of Lord is almost equal to the title of Count. And thanks to this, he could increase the number of soldiers to 50,000. He hoped it would be enough. The leader asked how many he needed, and he showed him five fingers, which confused a man who thought about five hundred people. But Arel meant five thousand. Jan shouted with joy and realization of his future earnings. He was shaking. Arel hoped they would be able to find that many people. Jan agreed with passion in his eyes, and asked the prince not to doubt him. Once again, Arel realized what wonders money could do. Arel held a sword made by dwarves. He liked the quality, and the blacksmith's skill impressed the prince. The only thing left to do was to teach the slaves self-defense. Arel ordered a complete set of equipment for all the slaves. There were a lot of boxes in the palace. There were five thousand pieces that were made in the shortest possible time. The slaves were not happy when they arrived at Fahilia. Arel wanted to cheer them up so that there would be a result. There were people in uniform standing outside. One of them drew attention to himself by shouting. They shouted glory to the great lord. The slaves raised their swords. They swore allegiance for the rest of their lives. Arel stood on a pedestal with Asa and Sena. Arel was smug. He hoped they were strong enough. It should be enough to defend the most important points. 
Arel was hoping to get some rest after all the hard work. It was already night. Strange people wearing masks and bandages were running through the snowy forest. They stopped. One of them looked around and found a paper mill. The goal of their mission was to destroy the factory in Fahilia. They wanted to remove all the machines and leave nothing behind. This would bring them a huge blow to the economy. It seemed to the enemy soldier that the owner of the place did not care about the safety of his factory. He liked the location of their order. If the mission was successful, he would get enough money to last him a lifetime. The enemy soldier gave a sign to the others. They saw only two guards, who would be very easy to get rid of. The enemies were coming to kill the guards. An enemy soldier stood behind one of them and closed his mouth, putting a knife to his throat. They killed the two guards. The enemy eliminated the guards. They continued to communicate with gestures. In a moment, they flew into the factory. They had to deal with the staff inside and destroy the machines. The enemy mercenary stopped in surprise. The factory was empty, and there was nothing at all. A guard appeared inside the fake factory with a bright stick. It blinded those criminals who could not open their eyes. There were even more guards. They grabbed the thieves alive and took them out of the room. One of them tried to escape. But it didn't work out. There was an ambush that he ran into. The enemy was shocked by the number of soldiers he had never heard of. Arel woke up. All of Sena informed him about the attack. The criminals were brought directly to the prince. They said they were just following orders. Arel did not care about that. It confused the masked killer. Arel reminded him that they had illegally entered his territory, killed his people, and destroyed other people's property. And he really thought they would get away with it if it was an order. Arel sent them for interrogation. He asked them to interrogate until they told him everything they knew. Asia and Sena were happy to fulfill this order. The criminal sat on his knees and begged for mercy. He shouted that he knew nothing. Arel was yawning behind him, and under the criminal's screams, he calmly walked away. He is not a supporter of violence, but there are things that no one could let go of. His mother, sister, friends. They were not strangers, and Arel was not going to tolerate if they suffered. These were the principles he could not overstep. After all, he had already gone through so many times. Morning. Arel stretched on his throne. The offenders have been interrogated and punished according to the law. They would live as slaves for the rest of their lives. They sat in a cage with their hands tied and their feet chained. But they really didn't know anything about the identity of the customer, so there was no use in interrogating them. Arel wanted to think of something else. He leaned his head on his hand to think. The prince got up from his throne. He could at least deal with the economy. He didn't have to worry about not having enough money for further development. Arella had many rights. He went to the room and was waiting to try something. It was something incomprehensible at first. But it was a magic circle for teleportation. Finally, Arel completed it. The price was, of course, sky high because all the components of this creation were magical. But it was worth it. If he hadn't had to redo it twice, he wouldn't have even complained. But he didn't want to think about it, because he was sure it would pay for itself. He continued to stand in front of the device, and thought that he could use it to get home. Arel picked up the magic stone, and put it in the tube. He knelt down on the circle, which began to glow. That was the end of his part. The other side had to do the same. Arel called his sister. Kanaya stood there a little scared. She did not really want to do this. Arel explained that it was just teleportation. He asked if she was just not feeling well. She stood there very frightened. Kanya didn't think that the other side was really waiting for her. Arel realized that the time had come for frankness. He told her that this was the way she would find out the answer to her question and asked her to concentrate. Arel took Kanya's hand and led her into a circle. Kania hugged Arel and shook with fear. He tried to calm her down and told her that it was safe and the only thing that could happen was that she would get a little pumped up. Arel was ready to start. A blue whirlwind rose around the teleportation circle. Kania screamed and asked Arel if it was meant to be. She squeezed Arel so hard that he couldn't breathe. 
the prince begged for help. And in an instant, everything began to change. They found themselves on the sunny ground outside the palace. Arel breathed out a sigh of relief. They were near a fountain and a table. Arel thought back to his childhood, which he had spent in during Cania. Arel felt at home. He turned up his nose and fell down on the lawn. He missed home so much and was glad to finally be back. He was glad to be warm on this earth. He hugged the grass with special tenderness. The nanny greeted the prince and princess, who were very happy to see her. She was worried that she had put the magic stone in the wrong place. But everything turned out to be simple, just as the prince had said. The nanny invited them to see Mrs. Lafania. The prince gladly came up from the lawn. And Princess Cania was waiting for Mrs. Finelia. The princess was clearly not happy about this. Arel and Cania agreed to part ways. Cania resigned herself to her fate, because she could not run away from her mother forever. Arel wondered how his mother was feeling, and he hoped that she hadn't denied herself anything while her son was away. The nanny opened the door for Arella, and he jumped in. Mrs. Lafania was sitting on a chair by the window. She was very happy to see Arel. He ran up to her and hugged her with all his strength. They were both smiling very much. Lafania noticed that the prince had grown up and said that she was very happy that Arel had come to see her. Her uncle, who worked for Fahala, wrote about everything that happened. She was very proud of her son. Arel mentioned that his uncle had lost some weight recently because he was tired. He had a lot to do because of the large production. Arel wanted to tell his mother everything that was happening in Fakila. Pamphlophania was only too happy to hear it. Arel knew he had to try harder so that his mother would not need anything. He led her by the hand into the garden. They sat down to tea. The prince told her that it was snowing all the time and there were lots of white rabbits. Mrs. Lafania admired this. But Arel remembered that these rabbits were three meters tall, but he decided that his mother did not need to know. The prince told her about his successes, about all kinds of animals living in those lands, including the indigenous population. He told her everything that could make his mother happy. Someone's feet stomped on the tiles. Arel turned around to see who it was. As always, it was on time. It was the queen who had disturbed them. She was surprised to see the prince back. Arel looked at her with indifference and pretense. The queen only pretended to be surprised by his arrival, although Arel had officially warned her of his visit. The queen played the role of a caring woman and expressed her joy to Lyphania that the younger prince was doing well. Arel wondered what she meant by that. Arel stood up from the table and inquired about her affairs, noting that he had heard that the eldest prince was doing well. With a nervous smile, the queen thanked him for his concern and added that everything was as usual in the palace. She had heard rumors that the economy in Fahala had recently flourished. Arel confirmed these words with a big smile and added that it was all thanks to the machine he had developed. He noticed that Elijah had no idea how happy the people of the empire were with the new products. The queen's eyes grew fierce. Tension ran between her and Arel. Arel was sure that the queen's pride was hurt by the fact that the prince she looked down on had hit the family business hard. In any case, his paper was several times better than hers. The queen put her hand on her head and said in alarm that it was not safe because there were rumors of robbers. Arel realized that it was her. Arel said that he had no problems. The queen again hinted that it was a great honor for the empire that her children were making such a great contribution, and she wished him to be more careful. Arel waved after her with a smile. He felt this aggression from the queen. Mrs. Lafania told Arel that the empress was probably in a bad mood. Arel agreed and said that it was probably because of family matters. Arel accepted Empress Elijah's summons. Sooner or later, he would have to anyway. The courtyard of the kingdom. Arel and Kanaya stood on the teleporter. Arel was saying goodbye to his mother. Mrs. Lafania wished him to be careful. Arel asked Kanaya how everything went, and she said with a displeased face that it was fine. She hit him on the head and asked him if he had started to take an interest in her meetings with her mother. Arel was a little hurt by the slap. Arel jokingly said, that he was worried about learning everything from the maid. 
he thought there would be a fight. But apparently, he just had a wild imagination. Kanaya asked him to end it. A magical whirlwind was created. Aurel waved happily to his mother and promised to come back. She wished him to take care of himself. That was the end of the visit home. A few days later at the Fahilia estate, there was a problem. Aurel was frustrated. He urgently needed a magician. The reasons why Aurel needed a magician. First, it is because mages can activate the teleportation circle without hindrance. A landowner definitely needs a mage on his personal territory. They can also help grow different crops with magic, not to mention trees for paper production. It would be the perfect assistant. And when monsters or enemies attack, the power of a mage can be a decisive factor. Aurel sat and thought about where he could get a universal wizard. The prince came to the library and jumped up and down to get a book that would fit his request. But he sat down on a chair without finding anything, only to lose his breath. Aurel fussed and grabbed his head, not knowing what to think of. And that was it. It was over. He fell into despair. The prince wanted to abandon the idea. But all nobles used the services of magicians. But to hire even one, he needed a lot of money. Arela had no face. He needed a whole magical detachment to protect a huge territory. It was so good in the imagination, but so difficult in reality. There was one very important moment. It was all about protecting a paper mill. Arel continued to sit with a thoughtful look. Even though the soldiers were doing a great job, what if some mercenary mage attacked? Of course, Asia and Sena were strong. Kanaya was also good. But in this world, magical power is also needed. You never know what might happen in the future. Arel picked up his pen and decided to look for a magician after all. He signed the document and stamped it with his own hand. The announcement was ready. It stated that a court magician was wanted. It offered a place to live, a high salary, and career advancement. All necessary resources will be provided. Employer, Lord Arel Arnesia, Lord of the Lands of Fahilia. He stood up from his chair and began to roll the letter into a bundle. Of course, he could send the request to the magic tower, but it would be quite expensive. An influential magic tower is greedy for money. Problem solved, Aurel had a great idea. He was sure that some free mage would be interested in the ad. A low-level mage would be fine with him. Aurel himself could make him a first-class wizard. Aurel ran down the hall. He thought he was a genius. It was a sunny day. There was a notice on the blackboard. People saw and read the notice, which mentioned Fahilia. A lot of people gathered around. They saw that it was the same prince who was constantly creating something new and making money on it. There was someone standing behind the crowd. He liked the conditions and hoped that they were accepting newcomers. While the crowd was considering applying, that mysterious magician fell face first to the floor. It was a girl. Some of the crowd asked if she was okay. She tried to push through the large crowd of people to the announcement. She read all the conditions. More than the housing, she was surprised by the food, which was free. This obviously bribed the scruffy girl. Arel, with his feet up on the table, was glad that so many mages had applied. He looked at the resumes on the paper he had made. Arel would like to hire them all and create an army of magicians, but for now it was impossible. The prince continued to look through the papers. He thought that it would probably be necessary to conduct an interview. Arel was not averse to personally testing their strength, but it was important that they did not become his enemies in the future. He also needed to be sure that he could trust them completely. If there was even the slightest doubt, he would cut them off immediately. Arel gave his resume to his assistant to check. And so the day of the interview for the magicians with a clean pass came. Many magicians stood in front of the prince's desk. It wasn't as fun as when Arel was choosing knights. He had spent quite a bit of money on the whole affair. Twelve magicians stood in a line. Arel told them that he had chosen them after studying their resumes, and now they would work for the prince. They unanimously thanked Arel. Their middle class was around the third level. Arel hoped he had made the right choice. The mages were happy because they had passed and had not been waiting for an hour in vain. 
Arel said that from then on he would give them tasks and teach them new skills. Mostly, they needed to take care of the forest and field, as well as protect the territory. Arel said that their wishes would be taken into account, so he asked the wizards to listen to him carefully. They listened happily and attentively as he asked. Arel asked for a show of hands from those who were fourth-level magicians. One of the people who raised his hand was Mankui Blog. The other was a girl named Dilecki. Mankui's slightly strange face filled Arel's mind. The prince closed his eyes and did not want to judge people by their appearance. He reminded himself that the most important thing was their skills. He looked at the candidates again and thought. The prince shook hands with Dee and wished her a good job in her new position. The prince chose her to be his personal magician. Arel didn't want to make excuses, but there was another reason why he chose Dee Lecky. On the day of the interview, Arel saw her. Arel said that with a resume like hers, she could have found much more favorable offers. The prince was curious why she chose to work in the north. Dee answered calmly, and a little strangely, that she wanted to serve the prince. Both Arel and the mages around her were surprised by her desire. The prince dropped the resume from his hands. Usually employees were interested in salary or opportunities, but she was talking about serving the prince. Arel asked if that was really the reason for her application. De closed her eyes and shook her head. Arel did not see any malice in her. She really sincerely wanted to serve the prince. Her aura was pure. Arel felt obliged to take her in. Arel was going to explain their duties and the benefits that mages would receive. Arel decided to start with the good stuff and open the door to the room. It was a huge library, and the mages were incredibly excited about it. They were squealing with joy. They thought it was a dream. But it was reality, a whole library of magical books. Literature that had been recommended by the Tower of Magicians themselves. The wizards immediately ran to the shelves and began to look for books to their liking. Luckily, the books themselves were inexpensive, but it was much harder to negotiate with the Tower of Magic. Arel hoped that the books would help the magicians become stronger. Arel went around complimenting the magicians. In fact, without Arel's help, they would hardly have become stronger and developed further. There were mostly mages who were not worthy of working for the Tower and outcasts. They were obviously happy to get this opportunity. The mages asked Arel if it was true that they could use these books. Arel said with a smile that they could, but he was going to check on their progress. He asked them to try to improve their knowledge. The wizard sobbed with the happiness the prince gave them. But Arel's goal was a little different. He was going to use them to study magic. He already knew the basics, he just needed to study it in depth. And the more bright minds there were, the easier it was. He had to do his best. And magicians still enjoyed books. First, there was a need to restore the forest. Too many trees had been cut down, which were a source of wood for paper. Arel came to the cut-down forest with a magician. He hoped that the magicians could revive the trees. They said it was possible. The three magicians stood around the sprout. They said a spell, and an unusual glow arose from which a new powerful tree was born. Arel was excited about what was happening. It was not just magical power, it took a whole ritual. Arel stood in front of the tree and wondered if mages could really influence the processes of growth. After all, nothing compares to magic. Arel approached one of the magicians and thanked him. He wondered if it would be possible to grow trees from scratch. The magician said with concern that if he kept doing this, the land would dry up. It needed a period of rest. It would be better to leave it like this for at least a month. Only then would the land be able to recover. Of course, no one has cancelled environmental problems. It's good that this world is not without good people. Arel thanked them for their work with a smile. The second was to help with the cultivation of crops. Arel came to the houses with the magicians. The inhabitants of Fakalia could not rely on hunting all the time, so they needed to harvest crops. The magician asked if she just needed to accelerate the growth of crops on the plot. Arel replied that ideally, she needed to accelerate the growth of crops in all twelve villages. This shocked the magicians a bit. But Arel shouted out that it was not all at the same time. 
he was not such an inhuman. Arel asked the villagers to create the necessary conditions. The prince wrote something down on a piece of paper and showed it to the magicians. They looked at it carefully and attentively. They thought about it and decided that if they used natural magic, they should be able to do it. The other magician said that this was true, but they had to save mana. Arel sat down at the box with the magic tools for the work and called the mages. Arel took out the magic crystals. He placed them around the territory. The prince fenced off the area with a magic barrier. It was only necessary to leave sunlight and heat to grow crops. They stood in front of this magic cube. It seemed to Arel that everything was working. The snow had melted off the grounds. All that was left was to test this trick in every village. Arel asked them to make sure that their people did not go hungry. Arel and the wizards were happy. After that, the two wizards went to the research department for magic tools. They sat around and wrote down something important. The three of them were appointed as guards for the palace and estates. They flew around on their brooms. There was only one thing left to do. Dilecki didn't know what to do with herself yet. Arel said that she would be his personal attendant and would run various errands. The prince could not use magic in front of everyone yet, he needed a magical assistant. The first task the prince gave Dee was to improve her personal magic skills with the help of books. She eagerly agreed, if that was the prince's will. Arel felt this passion for the work he was doing. The prince felt that everything she said was sincere, but he did not understand the reasons. She had a book behind her cloak that accidentally fell out. It was Prince Arel's book, The Path to the Heights of Chivalry. Arel picked up the property of the magician D. He remembered that he had once published that book about training for knights, but it was not widely distributed because the soldiers did not understand it. Arel gave D the book and asked her why a magician would need something like that. She replied that a friend had given it to her to read. Both the magician and the knight primarily control the mana inherent in them. The only difference was the amount of it. He read this out of the book. She continued that the mana management system for mages was no different and added that Arel's theory was suitable for mages. Arel was surprised. He had actually had similar thoughts. That is why this book became her personal Bible for D. She said this in all seriousness and reverence, holding the book to her chest. D said, she had crossed the continent to serve the author of this book. Arel was shocked. He understood the reasons for her desire to serve her. But he still didn't understand. There were only the basics of why she was moved. Dee mentioned the delicious rice on that continent. Arel didn't want her to bring up rice. In any case, Arel was glad that the reason for Dee's loyalty was so simple. Arel hoped he hadn't made a mistake with his choice and he hoped that everything would be fine on Fahelia.